<laughs> okay, greetings, folks, to Sentinel Apologetics. Um, right now, we're doing an impromptu discussion with a few atheists in the room from the group Fully Deconverted. Maybe you guys, since you're representatives of the group, maybe you can introduce the group to everyone and especially the, the president of the group, I guess. The, the head the leader. Wow, okay, I guess, uh, yeah. I guess I'll guess i start. And, and uh, why we are having this discussion. Go ahead. Okay, great. So I'm Kevin Wadi. Um, I'm the operations officer for Fully Deconverted. Uh, we're a group and a discussion group and a YouTube and Facebook group, private and public, whose value is to uh, to disenfranchise dogma, meaning whatever is, I guess, taboo to talk about, we want to talk about um, in the uh, atheist and theistic um, debate arena. So nothing is off limits. Um, our, our goal is to have theists and atheists and whoever, spiritualists or whoever, um, be able to get together and talk about uh, all the things that are important. Because for us, uh, skepticism and truth is, is king. So that's, that's, our, that's our motto, that's our value. So, and so we are a Facebook group um, and a YouTube channel who, uh, that uh, has a lot of theists and atheists in the group having good, solid, constructive discussions. Um, the group uh, will not tolerate trolling or anything like that or ad homonyms or anything like that. And so I know Hunter's in the group. I think, Rob, you've been in the group a couple of times. Um, the reason why I wanted, and Zek is our, um, our head writer of the group and the website. So the reason why I, I asked for this chat is to have a discussion. Um, I saw Hunter on, a, on Pine Creek today and I, it, a, a thought occurred to me. I, I would like Hunter and maybe you or anyone else to lay down the case for the presupposition of a God and uh, lay down the case for theism, you know, as, as long as you need to, so we can open this up for discussion for our group and for your, for your patrons also. Okay. Um... Hunter, do you want to take the floor? I, I don't know. I, I don't know how this goes. Like, who goes next? What do you What do you want me to do? Because I think it was a broad range uh, yeah. um, question for the questions, yeah. especially Hunter. Well, the idea. Uh, so, in the conversation, when um, to kind of cover what was actually being said was to actually get rid of the idea of presuppositions um, and start from scratch. I was talking to Paul G about it. And so with that, I started from scratch with the concept of God, whether he exists or doesn't exist, and then going towards if he's, if it's deism or if it's theism, and then going from that, um, if it's theism, that he's a personal God, it would be if, how is he related to? So it's kind of like an ongoing step-by-step. -step. And eventually that's how I got to Christianity. So with the presupposition of God, that's when you're building up a foundation that actually is consistent and uh, reliable. It actually goes where the evidence points to as well. So when you say presupposition of God, I'm actually starting with um, the idea of does a God exist or not, and then working towards everything else. So the only time there is a presupposition of God is when I'm already uh, been through that step. And I'm working with the ongoing steps. So that's how I, I uh, was trying to lay it out. <clears throat> and anybody else can talk to you. I don't, I don't want it to just be me. <laughs> yeah, uh, can I question that? Uh, you said that you, well, I, I heard that conversation that you guys are talking about where you asked uh, the atheist, I'm not sure it's the same. You asked him uh, if his, uh, if his unlearning of young earth creationism was the uh, reason for his atheism, and then he said that, no, that just made him realize uh, what he didn't know, so to speak, about the Bible even and, and about the presupposition of a God and stuff like that. Um, so then he started learning from there. And that's, that's basically what you just said. But I'm wondering how you, because you, you kind of phrased it that you started it wondering 
what God would be, uh, if it would be deist and if it would be something like that. But that that does sound like a presupposition. How did you get from uh, no God to realizing that there was one and then realizing that it had then had to be either deist or theist or something like that? How did you get from that step to that? Well, I, I didn't have <laughs> That there was no God. That's a presupposition in itself as well. So I didn't hold that presupposition either. It was more like starting in the middle. Either there is a God or there isn't. Not there is no God and I have to see if there is. I need to look at both sides of the coin. Because there are actually people who have arguments saying that it's more likely that there is not a God than there is. And here's why. So you can't actually lay down an argument for there being no God can't you would just have to say it agnostic and so that's practically what i started for given that reasoning i didn't actually know as much as i did then so or do you, do you spouse, so so hunter do you do you um the way i look at this you know we're um you've heard me say this many times on in the group um it's for me it's not a 50 50 proposition that there is or there isn't 50 50 it could be either one or the other um, starting off me, now, for me, it's not a 50-50. For me, it's okay. uh, there's there's no, I don't see any reason to, well, you know what? Let's back up. Okay. The word God, that has to be defined. There you go. Before we can even start. So, and I, I mean, we can go back as far as we can, but I think at the very beginning, what do you mean by God? And why is that meaning the real meaning of God? Okay. Um, so starting off, I got to the idea of God based on whatever it was that was beyond the universe that caused it. Whatever that is, to me, that would be this being or God or whatever starting off. Okay. So, I okay. Let's talk let me well, hang on. Let me, finish, let me finish real quick. Let me actually finish okay. to put okay. more into it. Because actually, the more ability or more um, uh, attributes I put towards God was came more down the line. So when it came to uh, which God, it was the one that was more consistent in actually defining um, what this cause would be. And so that's where you get the omnipotence, omniscience, um, transcendent, uh, spiritual kind of thing. Um, you know, unembody mind, all these things, and that's practically where I got into the Christian view of the God. So, when you, and I know that may be kind of broad because people like to decipher, like, oh, you know, which Christianity, but the essential beliefs, the core idea of Christianity, be where every denomination would agree, that would be my definition of God. And if, okay, so, and, okay, so I'd like to go. Yeah. Um, because um, that's, that's a big. That's a big uh, uh, oh, 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 I'm, I'm hearing an echo, by the way. Yeah. Oh, that's probably me. Okay, so um, and I really want you to be able to. Um, I'm kind of stepping you back because I really want you to be able to, um, you know, lay your case out. So, what does it mean beyond our universe? Did you hear me, Hunter? Okay. What we have to go. The first thing you said was something beyond our reality, or beyond nat our natural universe, or beyond. What? How can we talk sensibly about that? The same way we can. Yeah, I heard you. It's the same okay. way that we can actually talk about, uh, most, like the beyond dimensions that are not in a three-dimensional universe. So we know about. And since we actually have some scientists in here, uh, they can actually uh, vouch on me for this. But when it comes to the idea uh, that we're limited as three-dimensional beings, we can actually go beyond that and actually make logical sense of four-dimensional, ten-dimensional, um, however far it goes. Uh, even though we can't completely comprehend it, we can apprehend it, but we can't fully comprehend it because we're limited in ourselves. But we can still but make logical can, sense of it. But we can make sense of it. And the other dimensions mathematically, yep, and scientifically, yep, and that's it, right? And I have I a question. That, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is for Hunter. So, when you're defining God, it sounds when I hear you define it to me, it kind of sounds like what you're saying is a super powerful being outside of all of our dimensions and of space and time. 
Is that what you're defining, or is it something a little different than that? Um, that's part of it. I was just going to this up. The, the okay, problem. so I, I actually would, I guess if I were to answer the question, I would answer it a little differently than that. Okay. Um, I mean, do you, do you want me to take a stab at it, or? Yeah, you can go right ahead. This is a group yeah. conversation, so. Okay. Is there the still way, an echo, by the way? I no? think we're there, good. Not, okay, good. That I'm was not, me then. Sorry about I'm that. I'm not hearing it. And I apologize if my audio is not great. I'm, I'm in the car. But um, I guess the way I w would define the concept of God is the most metaphysically perfect, simple. Uh, I wouldn't actually call God a being, but more subsistence, subsistent existence itself. It, it is He is being itself. Because if we look at the reality that we're in, it's not just you know, everything is reliant on something else where everything is contingent on something else in terms of time and space, but simply by its essence of what it is. So if you drill down, you know, whether it be by part, so, you know, if I take my body and then I'm composed of, you know, many different materials that go down to the subatomic level, everything is dependent on something else. And eventually you're going to get to a point where what is that smallest, those smallest parts dependent on? What are they, what is giving them their existence? And eventually you're left at a point where it's either a brute fact that there just is something that is the beginning or there is something, you know, metaphysically beyond completely other than what is natural. Oh, sorry, I gotta go. I'm getting a call. Oh, shoot. That was good. Sorry. Okay. No worries. Um, Hunter, question for you. Um, and uh, and then Rob, you can chime in too. So is uh, Jared a theist? I, I don't know. I think he is. Yeah, he's, he's a Christian. He's a Christian. Okay, so then he's a theist. Okay. So he defines God, and then Hunter defines God a different way. By the way, Kevin, you uh, <laughs> suddenly it sounded like an atomic explosion just then. I don't know. It could be a loose oh connection. Gosh. You're in. Darn it. I'm on a wireless headset, man. I'll try to talk softer. How about that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I tend to yell. I'm, I'm old. I tend to yell on headphones. So. So Hunter, you um, you define God a certain way. Jared defines God a certain way. Um, but what's, but what's ironic God, though? What's okay. ironic though is that actually I agree with Jared though. Uh, that's another uh, thing. It, that's another way of defining God. Um, but I actually agree with him on that. Okay. Yes, just just so, quickly, Kevin. Just sorry, sorry for butting in. I just want to clarify <laughs> that when Christians defer on these sorts of things. Um, and you see this throughout church history as well. You see various theologians in the church father tradition trying to model out the, uh, I don't know if ontological is the right word, but like like the attributes of God. So we have these attributes of God claimed in the scriptures, but the mechanics of that, the, uh, the mechanisms uh, being creatures and human, we don't know how that works. And so kind of like how a scientist de develops models to hypothesize certain things. Um, so Hunter was coming from a more recent uh, mm -hmm. application context from people like, say, Hugh Ross, uh, being an astronomer. He's developed mathematical models to describe the Trinity. Whereas Jared, who I understand is also an engineer, will uh, be careful about that because at the end of the day, it's just a model. Uh, and if you know, being a Christian, if he's going to give reverence and and respect to God, he'll just leave it as him being the the essence and not defining it yeah. as anything else. Yeah, um, yeah, and I, I see that as pretty. Go ahead, Zach. Um, I was just kind of gonna try to flip the script of how we're talking about God, just to just for an experiment of thought, like. So we, we are talking about this character uh, that we have read about in a book, uh, and and there 
the, the problem with logic is uh, the reason why humanity has developed science is that is because things can be logical and not be real. So, so we have to analyze the logic. Uh, and, and if we simply talk about this instead of, uh, yeah, well, if we simply talk about this, we are talking about an anthropologi anthropologically perceivable unit of a personality that we perceive that is a personality that is kind of like we can relate it to a father and we can relate it to all these human a physician and a scientist and then we can add the word better to that and then it would be god so to speak uh, like we can't see the whole model but we can assume it um like the the problem with that is like th this is my issue looking from the opposite side of the lens uh, asking you guys do you think that it is impossible for humanity to come up with such a story and 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 to answer that question you know it would be helpful if we were standing i think in a huge library so that we could all be directly observing all the stories that we can't even fit into this building that humanity is real. like we can do this we can make invisible characters that that logically makes sense like superman logically makes sense it if he was real he would make sense because he would have super strong atoms where his body wouldn't break and he would be able to like uh you know go through time because of all these like metaphysics that we can logically deduce if it was real it would be real but so yeah, so but that's my I, that's my thing do, do you guys not think that humanity can come up with theology just without the inspiration of uh, divine. Humans, humans oh. can come up with all sorts of things, and as we have a, a yeah. special guest in the room, Sai God, he's he's. Oh, a you know, I'm sorry, guys. My uh, computer does this speaker thing where I, I have to restart the computer in order to hear anything. So I'll be back and uh, okay. hopefully I'll just rewatch. I'll hold this down the cord for you, Zach. <laughs> okay. okay do, do I shall I quickly answer if Zach's not here or? What I don't want Zach to miss us out. Yeah, why don't we wait for his answer, or yeah, your okay. answer for him to get yeah, back okay. on? Yep. By the yep. way, sorry about that. I I told Rob I could be t getting calls during this, and I have to take them. So that's I'll fine. To you, leave right in the middle. You, of that. Hopefully, I was making some me. sense. Yeah, that's okay. I was gonna say, while waiting. Well, I was going to say, uh, Robert, why don't you introduce our special guest? Yeah, yeah. Please? I was going to yeah. introduce the Cy God. Feel free to uh, go ahead and express any thoughts. Uh, thank you. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I just got this invitation 10 minutes ago, so I'm not really sure what the topic is. Uh, any, can anyone enlighten me a bit? <laughs> can I, can I go ahead and start that? Um, yes. so got, hi, I'm Kevin Wadi. I'm the, um, operations director for fully deconverted. So Hunter oh, Bailey okay. is in our, is it? Hi, how are you doing? Good. Good to meet good, you. Good, good. Yeah, good to meet you. I saw you on a show a couple of days ago. It was really good. Um, I think you were talking about science and evolution. Uh, and I think the guy was, what was his name? Um, I it, it could have been Aaron Ra or... Uh, it was uh, Aaron was debating a theist. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you mean. <laughs> and, he, and he walked out of it. Yeah, that was... Yeah, you, it was a non-sequitur show. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, there you go. And your your input right. and what you were saying was fantastic. So I really oh, respect nice. you as a scientist. I, my What I wanted Hunter to do, because I know that sometimes in these types of debates, theists are like put on the defensive and atheists are come on the attack with questions. So I wanted <laughs> Hunter to be able to... Uh, to um, just lay out his case um, for God and why oh. that should even be considered. Um, I saw him on the Pine Creek show today and I really oh, good. You know, enjoyed what he was saying. So um, I yeah, will I have a lot Pine of questions. Yeah. Oh, oh, fantastic. And I, good, I will have guy. a lot of questions. I like Doug. Yeah, yeah, I, I haven't heard a nice lot guy. of this stuff, but I like, yeah. I like that. So basically yeah. that's the context of this impromptu. Okay. Uh, um, discussion. Well, I, I don't, you probably know, because I said it, I, I certainly said it to Pine Creek Doug and to Aaron Ra and other people. I, I began as an atheist, uh, not just an atheist, but a very strong anti-theist. 
I grew up with no religion. When I say began, I mean from, from birth. My parents were militant atheists. Um, I had no religion until I was in middle age. And uh, so I, I also had a path to discover God. It took me a long time. I went through several, several stages, including agnosticism, and finally came to become a Christian. And uh, that's where I am now. Um, so I might be able to shed a little light on this question. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I know one thing I did not do was try to define what God is before hmm. I, you know, I didn't make a, I, I didn't say, well, let me see what is God and do I believe in him? What really uh, led me, event, the first step was really a rejection of my uh, original philosophy. Excuse my speech. I actually came down with Bell's palsy about a month ago. So oh, crap. one side of my face is paralyzed. So <laughs> I'm not speaking very well, but I'll do my You're best. You're sounding great. You're sounding great. Thank so you. Don't worry Thank about you. It. Yeah. Um, what I what I started out doing was rejecting mil strong atheism. I rejected materialism uh, and began to believe that materialism and, and I'm a scientist I've been a professional scientist my whole life uh let's see am I echoing or is that somebody else? somebody's echoing yeah it's, um and what I was learning in science was sort of going against to my way of thinking the materialistic worldview the pure materialistic worldview and so I began wondering if there was something else, and that else could have been anything from, you know, New Age spiritualism to, um, you know, to some kind of religion. And it took me decades to come to the understanding of the existence of God, and and it didn't come from thought or logic or reasoning. It came from direct experiences which I think is not mm. unusual. I think it's fairly common from what I've heard from other people in my situation. However, once those direct personal experiences occurred, everything suddenly made sense in a way that had not before. And it did very much feel like you know, a revelation uh, as has been described by many other people. And uh, I'm now, utterly convinced of the existence of God. I'm utterly convinced that Jesus Christ is my personal savior. And I'm still utterly convinced that science is the best way to determine the reality of the physical universe. And I, one of my, well, I guess my major mission in life these days is to try to dispel as much as I can, along with a lot of other people who are doing the same thing, the false concept that science and religion are antagonistic and uh it's a fairly new idea it started about 100 odd years ago 120 30 years ago uh, it certainly was not true for most of western history and uh i guess that's my general take on this issue so you're you you ascribe to the uh, what the separate magisterium or whatever however it's called that there was a the, 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 the non-overlapping yeah. magisterium Steve J Gould yeah uh, well I you know that's an it seems that nobody likes that I mean <laughs> uh, strong atheists don't like it uh, a lot of Christians don't like it. I I love Gould. I thought he was a brilliant guy, and I liked it at first because I felt, okay, like Gould, I thought, well, this is a good way to stop the fighting between the two mm -hmm. groups. But I don't hold to it anymore because I don't believe there are two magisteriums. I don't believe there are two kinds of truth. I think there's only one truth. And I believe, and this is very controversial, that the one truth is stated both in our scientific knowledge and in scripture. And the reason that's controversial, and I don't expect everyone to agree with me, 
or very few people agree with me, is that it appears that that's not that that can't be right. I mean, scripture tells us things that seem to go against science. And I think that that is simply because we're sometimes getting scripture wrong. We're not in turn. We're not interpreting it correctly. We're not understanding it properly. And sometimes we're getting science wrong and we're not understanding that correctly. Uh, we have a long way to go. Sorry. Can I interrupt you for a second, Sai? Sure, please because do. You are saying so much and I, I really wanted to talk to you. So but one thing, um, do you, how do you reconcile Mm -hmm. the natural world scientifically and at the same time talk about a supernatural world mm -hmm. that is that uh, uh, denies or betrays any kind of explanation how do we even talk about the supernatural and from well, a scientific mind how do you justify talking we, about we, okay so that's a very it's an excellent question uh I can talk about it for hours, but I'll try not to. <laughs> um, science, by definition, deals with the natural world. That's the only thing that science ever can do. And uh, scientists have known this since the beginning of the scientific revolution. So even though most of the original scientists were deeply religious Christians, Robert Boyle, et cetera, uh, Faraday, Maxwell, on and on. Uh, they knew that their science, using their methods, would have no relevance to proving the existence of God. As Newton originally put it, his, he felt his task was to understand how God what, what were the laws that God created when the universe was created? So it, your question about how do we get the supernatural into the scientific worldview is we don't, we cannot. So there's no scientific proof or evidence. Well, there's some evidence, but it's, it's more like a pointer than an actual, actual proof for God. It, God being supernatural is outside of the scientific realm, can either be proven or disproven. And I think that's the first question. But there's something else that needs to be said, and that is the natural world that we know, the, the world of physics and more and more the world of biology, is not the kind of materialistic, fairly straightforward world uh, that can be understood by the mind of man either. I, I mean, you know, it's it's what, I don't remember who said it, but one of the pioneers in, in quantum mechanics said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't. Uh, that is starting to apply to biology as well. I mean, the level of complexity in all of the sciences is is extremely strange in the sense that I don't know of any scientific field, and if anyone does, please correct me, where anything has been completely resolved. We, the more data we get, the more information we discover, the more questions are raised. And, and that one the, uh, can stop and ask, why is that so? It's kind of strange. Isn't that the- Can I just, whole, can I just uh, jump in point? quickly? Yeah, sure. Sorry, sorry, Kevin. I just want to add on what Sai was getting at, um, especially at the start of his answer there. Yeah, um, you have Christians like Maxwell, one of my favorite, uh, a Presbyterian he was. And when he wrote his differential equations on the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, the most fascinating thing about his devotions was that he would then connect the science with his theological devotions that the true light of the world is Jesus. But what I find interesting is mathematicians like Leibniz, who, by the way, I think was the guy who did calculus better than Newton. <laughs> it may be controversial to say that, but uh, he would then associate from ancient Jewish thought, uh, going back to the first century, going back to second temple Jewish theology, and and on it goes, that um, the that there's there is no such thing as a supernatural. 
the the whole notion of like Romans one twenty, uh, through the creation we can understand God's invisible attributes, his power and his divine whatever he you know he does. Basically the Jews did not have a dichotomy or a uh, th there was no split like here's you know supernatural realm and then here's the universe. Uh, it's kind of like a pantheistic sort of thought that everything like God is in everything yet God at the same time is above and so that's how God's able to interact with the universe like the incarnation for example or anytime God interacts. Uh, meaning that miracle, such things as miracles are unique events, but they don't contradict the laws of nature. So that the uh, whole thing, though, seems so circular and well, special that, that, leading. That Go used ahead, to be my argument, too. Uh, and, and this is, I mean, there's a lot of philosophical talk that can go into it. And we Well, this, this relates to Zach's initial question before you had to leave. This actually very nicely fits with Zach's question. So Zek was saying humans are able to create create these imaginative stories like Superman. I find it curious that, uh, th well, that is true, but I find it curious that stories like Superman are no different to the ancient Near Eastern myths where you have beings that actually do contradict the laws of nature. So you will never find, like, Psy can, can agree with this, biologically, and, and the li the universe has its limits. You can't have a being with lasers coming out of his eyes but here you have jesus and the events that god does in the bible that do that actually do not have superman's attributes you won't find well, jesus shooting lasers out of his eyes but he will walk on water okay. okay wait a minute but that's like saying uh well he he couldn't fly he could only breathe underwater i mean hey it's it's the same uh the same amount of probability of breaking the natural law i mean not really, because for example, the 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 converting the water into wine uh, miracle in John two, John two has specific geographical details given with respect to the type of water that was used to convert it to wine. So basically, you have fermented grapes everywhere in the region in Cana. The water was not distilled water; it wasn't just pure H two O that Jesus converted. You already have the materials there, the building blocks, and because he's God, he's able to you know, tweak right, it and then right. make it into wine. Yeah, but You're that's... Uh, that there there were, like, vineyards around, so he used water to alchem alchemically transmute uh, these molecules out of it and turn it into wine? Yeah, he didn't, that, <coughs> he, didn't create, he didn't create wine and the alcohols ex nihilo. He didn't just zap them into existence, because then that would wine. be contradicting the laws of nature. Wait a minute. Okay, wait. So <laughs> if, if, if you can rearrange molecules, that's not contradicting what a primate can no, do. No, we do it all but the time. If you oh. spontaneously generate them, that is contradicting. Yeah. So we, so basically, we, we do it in science. We, we can rearrange matter. Not, so with, like, not with theological telekinesis, though. I mean, that, that's not how it works. Well, the, there is such a thing as way as far as conservation of energy and thermodynamics. So if if I were to break up an egg, there there is a philosophical thought process where if you were to rewind time theoretically, where you unscramble the egg, that is a possibility. Okay, but what but you'll have to do is you'll have to, you'll have to have a power. Energy. One sec, you'll have to have a power where you'll have to govern literally every molecule or atom of that egg to reverse itself back into its shell again. And humans can't do that, obviously. But God can. But he won't okay, be contradicting but, the laws of nature. That, He's just but, reversing but, thermodynamics. But but reversing thermodynamics is contradicting the laws of nature. Yeah, that's, that's the magical power. Yeah, Not I mean, really, because, different magical because power. John Carroll himself would speak about the Big Bang in that context, just reverse at the arrow of time, and, and then you go back to zero. Okay, but, but okay, but, kind of, yeah. kind of, I'm on the common ground at this point. You yeah. can have multiple superpowers, and you can describe them differently. If I have the ability to create a tidal wave, it is different than if I have the ability to turn my cup into gold. Uh, if I have the ability to manifest dust, it is different than if I have the ability to telekinetically rearrange molecules. 
sure these are different magical abilities, they are all still on the same capacity of magical ability, though, because we cannot do that. So, and then to present, well, if uh, this is what your argument went back to, well, if the thing is Israel, if the thing is real, then of course it can do that. But if Superman is real, of course he can do that as well. That's the point that hasn't been rebutted yet. Like, it, you, we can make logic about things that don't exist. But that isn't an evidence for that thing. That's true. You can you can create the most ridiculous creatures like H.P. Lovecraft's demon creature. Absolutely. And you can make the most outrageous imaginative know, ideas, but, but will it comport with reality? So, for example, Jurassic Park, Steven Spielberg's Park a movie with the T-Rex chasing the Jeep, that is physically impossible. A T Rex well, cannot run at thirty miles an hour without any without walking through, uh, uh, like say, uh, uh, at least water at, at its knee height. Through okay, uh, wait. So like, so let's back this up. Um, so Rob, uh, we're talking about impossibilities. We're talking about uh, nature. Is it uh, can a donkey speak? Right. That's a guess against. They don't have the lips, the tongue, the the anatomy. The brain to speak mm-hmm. was that against was that against the laws of nature? So those examples, I agree that I need to look into more. So, for example, okay. the, uh, the talking snake in Genesis mm-hmm. three, there's there is no talking snake in the text because we've been able to decipher now what Nakash means in the text. Um, now, with respect to the donkey, I find it curious that there is there has been archaeological evidence about. A character named Balaam. Extra biblical uh, details on that. But with respect to the donkey itself, uh, it could be that the donkey did not talk. It could be there could be some ancient Near Eastern context behind the donkey talking. So um, here's 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 so my problem. I'll need to see. Sure, and I, I I need you, Robert, and Sight and Hunter to help me out here, because from um, I was a theist for, you know, I'm 54. I was a theist my whole life. I was a Christian, charismatic, spoken tongues, had the the uh, regeneration experience, the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit experience. I was a worship leader for 20 years. And uh, at, at the end of the day, as, as I studied more deeply, I realized, you know what? I don't, I can't believe this anymore. And so I deconverted. That's a short story. But... When you're talking about uh, what you just said about, well, you don't know, the donkey maybe didn't talk, but we don't know, okay, the, the serpent in the, the Garden of Eden didn't talk. Um, some but people say the Garden serpent. of Eden was real. That's, that's the point. I beg your pardon? It wasn't a serpent anyway to begin with. That's that's the point. Okay. So that, and that's that's part of my point. So it wasn't a serpent, you think. Right. But then we hear, we hear that it was uh, with other people. So how, I mean, throughout the throughout the last two thousand years, um, I might uh, I'll say two things and I'll shut up. The last two thousand years, uh, we have Christians saying all kinds of things about all of these subjects, and um, some of the some of the things have to do with actually the the criteria for salvation. So they're they're salvation issues, and uh, and then some of them are leaders, some of them weren't. So who are we to believe? And the second thing I have for Sai, the last thing, is Sai. I, in in fully deconverted, I've heard people say, "Well, you can't ask for evidence for God because God will not show evidence in the natural world. He's a supernatural being." So it's kind of silly for atheists to talk about evidence. But what else are we to go by? Because experiences are very, very varied in so many different ways. Yeah, Sai, Sai, you you go first, and then I'll, I'll interact. Well, can I, uh, I can I, I want to say something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like to respond to the first one um uh, because you ma- you make the um the statement that theologians Christians make all sorts of different claims who are we to believe, right? But there's a problem with that line of thinking because pe- everybody comes up with all sorts of different things literally almost about everything, but of course not all of it's true. So mm-hmm. So does that mean we just give up on everything, on knowledge altogether, because nobody can agree? 
No, you have to decipher it through, go through what actually it all points to, and actually come to where the evidence leads. Instead of just saying nobody can agree, and therefore it, it should, everybody should just be agnostic on it. I, I, think I didn't do it therefore. I didn't do it therefore, though. But it was a but, question. Right. And I think by the, if you were to use that same kind of logic, same kind of logic on the entirety of the human population, nobody can know anything. And we know that's not how it works. So you have to decipher what, where does it actually lead to? And right. so, and that's I, my answer to that. I agree with that. And, and would like to add something on top of that. Um, that's definitely the right way of thinking about things. Like you, you uh, can't point to people that uh, don't know something essentially and then say that nobody should, but yeah, that that is a basic logical truth that uh, when we add a contingency like there like if we add the contingency that there is actually a being that ultimately is always trying to talk to you that changes the the, the entire dynamic extremely because the, you're being told that this this thing this invisible thing is doing everything that it possibly can to try to uh, convince you but then it uh, apparently for thousands and thousands and thousands of years it has not helped anybody really understand what the heck it is uh, and except for i mean the people who do believe that they already know what it is i mean and that's still disagreed upon i mean uh it is kind of the argument of silence like it this being has nothing to lose. Uh, we don't have to be doing this right now. We don't have to be getting together and trying to figure out if it exists. Uh, it could just be like, uh, Kevin, Zach, you're wrong. Let me explain, uh, you know, who I am, why I'm here. Uh, so just so that you have, so that you are like, you know, finished with this misconception, but it doesn't do that, even though it is a being who is supposed to essentially do that, uh, according to what people have kind of wanted. Um, just to address the uh, the question itself about who should you believe, um, the answer is Robert. I'd place all bets on Robert. Definitely go with Robert. Um, yeah. He's a beautiful Hebrew semeticist. Well, actually, he knows one. Um, but yeah, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All uh, right. I was, I was curious. Just this is like completely off topic, and I was just I had this thought the other day, and I was thinking of you guys, uh, Hunter and Robert, and I was thinking, if uh, this is just a hypothetical, because I never thought about this as a Christian. It's not really an argument against anything or for anything. Um, if you were to do some scholar, like read read some uh, scholarship uh, that that just radically changed what you how you perceive the gospels and the epistles. Um, and if you were to come to a point in your life where you uh, just couldn't accept it anymore, like, okay, maybe you could, maybe, maybe you couldn't figure out if Jesus was a, uh, a person that got deified or maybe you uh, thought they didn't even exist in the first place. Would you, would you be a Jew? If um, I mean, if would you convert to Judaism if you're convinced uh, that Jesus didn't come. Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly answer this question, then Ty, you go ahead and offer your thoughts on the prior question. Um, that's actually a good question, and it's related to, you know, what Hunter was getting at, like, who do you accept and all that, and the data points. So, I, I've been a Christian since 2009. Um, I've held views out of my own private reading of the Bible uh, that were both true and faulty, but let's stick with the faulty ones. Uh, so, for example, I would find it odd uh, to, to see passages like Jesus being the Son of Man riding on clouds. Uh, I would find it odd about, say, the head covering issues. I would find it odd with certain Old Testament laws. Um, and, and let's just say that just so we know Everyone knows, including me, when I was looking at the text, that this is an ancient document. Obviously, in anthropological studies, there are humans uh, that think a certain way and write a certain way. I mean, just look at the, say, the Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and, and what it entails in that book. Now, as, a, as someone trained uh, in the sciences, you know, coming from a university background, an academic background, 
you are ought to then leave the question mark in those spots. You can't just start hypothesizing things and then ho and then hold on to that as if that is the gospel truth. So that's what I did. And the question marks I would get back to, like kind of like just then with what Kevin asked about the talking donkey, which by the way, I just brought up on my computer engineers and studies on how that fits in the engineers, and which I can share with them later on. So those question marks I will then leave there and I wait for the peer review and the scholarship to slowly churn it out. And also at the same time, I'll wrestle with it, have conversations with people. And then it leads into a more coherent picture down the track. Uh, so for example, the head covering situation, I was fascinated to find out that it's actually about Greek, Greco-Roman medical observations in Paul's day, especially in Corinth, that a woman's hair was uh, basically a substitute for male testicles. And that's why they were to cover their hair because a head to cover the hair means they're, they're not going to be naked in their thinking. Anyway, the point is, is that I did not know about that type of interpretation beforehand. But sure enough, through scholarly research and keeping up to tabs with the, with the data, I then uh, laid my, I guess, uh, my ego or whatever you want to call it, your pride or arrogance at the feet of the data and the scholarship and allow that to dictate what's going on. So with respect to being a Jew, no, I can't be a Jew because when I go back to Second Temple literature and I read now because of the recent discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and the Qumran community, I know that things like the Trinity doesn't contradict the Qumran literature because they already had this thing called the two powers in heaven. They had a, a binatarian view of God well before the Trinitarian doctrine came on the scene. So the Unitarian Jews of today are actually contradicting the first century Jews in Jesus' day. And so I, therefore I can't then right. just go, so oh, would, I'm going to be a Unitarian Jew now. And, and you, you know, wouldn't be a modern Jew, but you would be a form of Judaism, Judaism sect uh, that you appropriately fit well, into. Well, a Christian, a Christian technically is a Second Temple yeah, Jewish Mormonism. They're all Judaism sect. So, so your, your answer is, yeah. That's why we call it a Judeo-Christian worldview, because we do we okay. do come down the line of, of Second Temple Jewish theology. So, so, you, so, would so up, you would back up and say, uh, like, if this is, this is presupposing that you would find in, in the way that you just explained epistemology, basically, uh, if you found that Jesus was not the thing that you thought he was, you would just, you would rewind into Judaism. And, and that, that's uh, not to I would, this, well, uh, first and foremost, I would, yeah, first and foremost, I would, I would, uh, it's, it's like saying, what if general relativity is not true? You know, there's a lot, a lot of literature. We, we can prove general relativity to 20 places of a decimal point, which is ridiculously accurate as far as science goes. And so the sigma value, the probability of general relativity being disproven is so minute. Wait, it's the same kind of thing with the scripture context and Jesus. So I'll, I'll have to then question, hang on a second. Now I'm, I'm shown evidence that Jesus is not who he claims to be. Then what about all this? And then we've just been deceived. That's but, the, but, that's the yeah. So, so, so that, Robert, that, I want to go ahead, Zach. Now I want to say something. You, you're relating to the evidence of Jesus as if it were approximate to the evidence of relativity. Yeah. And, oh, okay. Kevin. Yeah. I. Um, so, Cy. I, I, by the way, by the way, Cy. Let Let Cy talk because. Yeah. I wanted yeah. to hear Sai. Sai, what do you say about all of this? Because we well, see... I... Go ahead. No, no, uh, finish your question, sorry. We well, see... no, I, we see a, a, a kind of a, a blending of a theology with science right now, yeah. which I don't think is warranted. Uh, because the, the, to, to make that equation or is, is a non sequitur, it's, it's, it's just even, it's, they're in different worlds. They don't even equate. In my opinion, what do you think? Well, what what they are is they're different epistemologies. I think that's very important to bring in here. Uh, Zach started talking about that a little bit. You know, science is a very clear epistemology, which is often called the scientific method, which is which has to do with 
and it's very successful. It works very well. Uh, it has proven to be useful and, and workable. And it tells us a lot about the natural world. It tells us probably everything we want to know about the natural world. But there are many things that the scientific epistemology, the scientific method, objective, repeated uh, experiment and observation, et cetera, which you all know about, there are many things that that approach cannot address. And it's not just the question of supernatural. There are many things in our modern in human life uh, that are not addressable by uh, the scientific method. And I will tell a story which I always tell, and it's coming up again now, so pardon me if any of you have heard it before, but I did have a conversation with a very militant atheist who was explaining to me that science can answer all questions, all questions. And when I asked him how do you scientifically determine the value of, of a piece of artwork, how much, you know, what the quality of the art is. Uh, how do you determine that, you know, your preference for Kandinsky over Monet is correct or not? His answer was you look at the market value, the price that it's sold for, and that's an objective measure of its value. Um, so, you know, you can, one can descend into the absurd when you start trying to push the concept of what's often called scientism, uh, you know, that the scientific epi uh, epistemology works for everything. It clearly doesn't. Yeah. And when it comes to spirituality, to issues concerning God, the supernatural, miracles, all the things that we've been talking about, the scientific epistemology, the scientific method, is not any use it's it's not of no use i shouldn't say it's of no use it's it's a very very limited use there are things about the natural world that to me point to god and could be evidence of god and that includes you know just the origin of the universe a lot of things about the origin of life and a lot of things about human beings that to me are not proof of god at all but they they're things in the natural world that point to something beyond the natural world as a creator. Now, that's my so view. Ask, okay, so I want to ask you because that's a, I mean, I, I appreciate what you just said. The, uh, of, of course, I don't know any scientist that's a, a, screw, a true skeptic that would say that science can answer every question. Right? Very few scientists, scientists say that. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, um, so the questions that can't be answered or have not been answered yet throughout the centuries have, have uh, eventually been answered by science and there are a million questions that aren't answered. So when we bring in the supernatural, which as yet is not defined um, and any interpretation of the supernatural, what, how do we test? What is the definition? Because there are a million definitions out there. Maybe I'm over exaggerating. How, how would you? How would you define the supernatural? I'm just curious. Good question. And so the, the, science the supernatural is, is, I think the definition is simply what it says. It's something that is not part of the natural world. And then, of course, you have to define the natural world. So that gets tricky. But rather than going to, go into these definitions, Kevin, you said something that I want to get back to, which is that science has answered millions of questions, and there are still millions and millions more that science will eventually address. But actually, I think the reality is quite different. Science will never be able to address certain questions of human nature, like love and art and things that are, you know, not science. I mean, there are, there are attempts to do that now using neurobiology, but I find them very pseudoscientific. But even worse than that, science, if you look at things like, you know, uh, the, the, the uncertainty principle, if you look at things like Godel's theorem, science itself has found that there are some questions that scientifically cannot be answered. We will never figure out how to determine the mass, I'm sorry, the position and the momentum of an electron at the same time. That's a fundamental fact of nature from the, from the, the uncertainty principle. And that was the first of several, there are now three or four uh, principles that come out of science that tell you 
that there are some things that cannot be answered. Uh, the whole question of why, and I'm not now talking about cosmology, but every scientific, every physical law involves constants, which are numbers. And the origins of the, those numbers can be, can be determined experimentally, but we cannot understand why those numbers are those numbers, except that they work. And that's fine. We don't need to know why they are, but that's another question why? that science can't address. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think that some atheists have said that why is a really nonsensical question? Some atheists have said that. Yes, yeah. they have. And so, um, I, uh, and I, yeah. I think that's a nonsensical statement, frankly. Hey, real yeah. quick I mean, though, <clears throat> real quick, if I could add to this, like, um, Cy, look, um. There is a like an actual like comment that was put out in the live chat, and it actually stuck out to me. And I wanted to know um, if you thought this statement was pr practically true that it's hard to unlearn what we now what we know now. And that was the sigh. It's hard to unlearn what we now know. Yep. I, I I'm not clear. I understand why should we unlearn yeah. anything. So pre well, exactly. So pretty I much. I don't get it. So pretty much what it's saying is that. Uh, what we now know, it's hard to kind of backtrack and say and say as if like um, yeah, kind it of, was kind of like what I mentioned about relativity. Now you can't unlearn. Oh, okay. the yeah, yeah. Well, why, why would you want to? I don't understand the context. Yeah, yeah my thought experiment was not to say that somebody should uh, logically commit suicide. That wasn't what, exactly what I was saying. Um, but the point is, though, however, with that is that's the point we're making with what we now know, because yeah, it's no, not like we can go back. But what do we it's know? Not, it's what, what we now know in a positive direction. It's not. But a, what do we know? It's not anti-biblical, yeah. pro-biblical. And, and this is kind of a debate. We can't like get into scholarship, scholarship stuff just now. We can maybe just throw stuff out. But what what my proposition was saying is that of course we are subjective beings. You know, I, I wasn't saying that anybody should uh, intentionally stupefy themselves. Like I was saying that sometimes we get things wrong. If, for instance, uh, I we have all read different scholarship, and as we know, all all doctorate level uh, authors and they have different opinions. So so there is this spectrum of uh, opinion. You guys use uh, you guys use certain things that evidence that other people do not credit for evidence for reasons that other people understand that you might not. And, and, and my, like that goes vice versa as well. I, I, I was not uh, in telling anybody that they should potentially uh, know something and then pretend or intentionally tell themselves that they don't, so to speak, you know? So, um, uh, Sai, I want to get back to you because uh, uh, you, you're you're a great mind. You're a scientist. You you um, you uh, you're a scientific mind. And uh, I guess my question is, you you see the science in multiple fields. Uh, is are you a cosmologist or are you a uh, uh, no? I'm a biologist? biochemist. I'm a biochemist. You're a biochemist. Yeah. Okay, so you have that. You're a biochemist, and so but you're also a, a believer, a theist. But you didn't yeah. use your biochemistry. To uh, to inform your theism, correct? Am I correct in that? Yeah, I I mean, uh, yeah, I mean that's okay. not how I came to faith. Not the okay, so you came to faith through an experience that you attributed to the divine, right? A number, yes. Through the spirit, you know, a number of experiences. Right. So when you when you're talking to atheists um, like me who have had the experiences mm -hmm. and and uh, are saying, okay, they say nothing to me, they say nothing about the divine. They say something okay. about the human experience that we don't know. And okay. um, I would agree with you that science uh, um, has answered many questions and science may not ever answer some of the more important questions. Um, okay. I think it's maybe, it may be an overreach to say that science will never answer certain questions. I mean, I don't know, we don't know. Um, I'm sure there are some questions that will never be answered, but uh, but to to jump to a God that is ill-defined 
and uh, um, and I, and I, I, I you yeah, understand what I'm trying he, to say? How is he? Ill -defined? Well, ill, ill, ill definitely. Yeah. First of all, I'm not sure he's God is ill-defined, but second of all, I don't think definition is such a is such a necessary thing. Uh, there are a lot of things that are ill-defined. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, string theory is terribly <laughs> ill-defined. There are many theories of physics that are not defined at all, except mathematically. But that doesn't mean we understand what they mean. But isn't that, in other words, but it's hard to define. Solid? Sorry. But is but isn't that? No, they're um, very solid. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that's my point. You you yeah. can you can believe that something is true. You can have complete faith in something, and that could be string theory, or it could be. Uh, you know, uh, general relativity or quantum mechanics, and I believe all those things are true. I, I hard to define them. Uh, so, and, and that's because, and that's because, sorry. What? How do I justify my belief then? Oh, uh, through evidence. There's as as Robert was saying. There's huge evidence for all of these physical realities. Mm -hmm. It's mathematical evidence, but it do, and and we can understand mathematics, but we cannot really make sense of it because our brains after all evolved from you know primates and so uh, i have a question for you si if you don't mind you said yes. that we should justify our beliefs based on the evidence but then yes earlier when you gave your um testimony or your conversion story you said that the instrumental factor that converted you was your experience or right. your religious which, which experience yeah so how, i mean how do you reconcile the two well by the way I, I, i'm a, I'm, I'm a theist i'm just uh i'm just curious well, i, I reckon because the concept or the, the 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 premise that personal experiences are not evidence i think is false they're okay, not cool. yeah. they're not scientific evidence that's where we talk about epistemology again but they are evidence. They're yeah. evidence to me. Now, I am not going around like many apologists do. I don't go around trying to prove that there's such strong evidence for God that everyone should believe, even if they have no other reason to except for the evidence that I present, because I don't have that kind of evidence to present. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a reason for that. I don't think that's strange. I think that if God suddenly appeared to all of humanity in a flaming chariot and spoke to everybody and said, here I am, you have no possibility of not believing in me, and everybody now had to believe in something called in, in God, the way we all believe in the existence of the IRS. I mean, did anybody here want to deny that the IRS exists? <laughs> I'm assuming we're all Americans. Okay, the IRS exists. Okay, do we worship it? No, it's a pain in the neck. And, you know, maybe God doesn't want every single human being to be forced to believe in him. Maybe he, I don't know. I don't know the mind of God. Nobody does. But perhaps the idea that faith is required, it's not all a question of evidence, is not, is not an accident. Maybe that's part of God's plan. I don't know. But it's a possibility. Just a, quick, a quick statement to say, um, relative to what Mark just said and also Kevin um, about, so Kevin specifically when he spoke about his spiritual experiences, uh, not the science, which then you confirm that as a biochemist. But then in our past discussions, Sai, especially with respect to scientists like Fazal Rana from Reasons to Believe, mm -hmm. you yourself uh, can acknowledge that things like uh, what happened 4.4 billion years ago with the origin of life um, or mm -hmm. origins, depending on, you know, if life comes from, you know, panspermia context, uh, like things like that uh, direct ourselves towards a divine sort of uh, situation. I would kind of disagree just wholeheartedly there because uh, that very well could point to, logically, this could point to a highly evolved fungus that has birthed the world. There's so many problems with the origin of life. It, they, yeah. actually, the, last year, there was the International Conference of the Origin of Life, and I kid you not, uh, all of them were conceding 
a uh, Prometheus type situation. The movie Prometheus, where you have aliens coming mm -hmm. and seeding life. That is yeah. literally where they are at right now. Well, it, it I don't want to get too technical, but there are some major problems which include the timing of the origin of life. And that's one of the reasons that panspermia is making a big comeback. But anyway, that's a technical issue. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is like an addition to all of you guys kind of interrogating you, Sai. <laughs> Sorry, like just adding something onto all like the other questions. Uh, so we've established that you had a revelation, so to speak, and, or, or multiple revelations. Have you, as a scientist, looked into uh, just even the the you know uh, the typical layman's uh, area of understanding like cognitive science and have you discounted that that could have naturally happened scientifically or, oh, or yeah, I, I, I'm sure it naturally happened. I, I mean, I, the fact that God is supernatural does not mean that God does not act in the natural world. God is responsible for the natural world. So it, it's yeah, not that I, we I, have it. So, so l let me just finish this thought. It's important. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's not religion versus science as explanation. Science is the explanation. But the explanation for science, the explanation for the natural world in its entirety, to me, is God. So, yeah, it could have easily been a cognitive, uh, you know, emotional state of mind that, trig that was triggered uh, somehow. And uh, and and a good explanation could have could be arrived at, uh, other than my belief that this was a direct experience of Jesus speaking to me. Uh, it could have been a hallucination. People suggested all kinds of things, and a lot of people have experienced things like that, uh, which could be hallucinatory, etc. Uh, I don't think that matters because. Remember, well, well I, don't, I shouldn't say remember, uh, Lord Kelvin, who was a Christian, wrote in a book around the turn of the last century that mechanisms are not explanations. So we can discover scientific mechanisms, but that doesn't explain anything. And, and of course, John, John Polkinghorne has this famous example, which is why is the kettle boiling? And the mechanism is there's a lot of heat going, which is, you know, stimulating the molecules in the water to move fast. But the reason that the kettle is boiling is because he wants to make a cup of tea. So the scientific explanation for why the water is boiling does not answer the why question. So why I had the experiences, dreams, and other experiences that I had mechanistically uh, is not going to be answered by neuroscience. Neuroscience will contribute to the answer as to the mechanism, but not the, the deep reason, the question of why those experiences occurred. And I, let me just say one last thing, because I do have to leave. Uh, and that is, thank you, Robert, for inviting me here. But um, no worries, si. I'm a little bit ill, so I, I, I do need to to get off. Yeah, so. we'll, we'll be praying for your healing as well. Thank so. you very much. I appreciate Can it. I say yeah. something to Sai real quick before he goes? Sure, go ahead. Hey, Sai, I, I really respect uh, what you're saying. Um, I, I'm very happy that you're on the call, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more of your more of your thoughts. So thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you, Kevin. I have some questions for you, but maybe we'll do it another time. <laughs> nice good. to meet you, Sai. Take care, dude. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Take care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Just, um, just a quick statement to Zach before yes, everyone goes, you know, free range. Um, interestingly, from a cognitive neuroscience context, the whole dualism argument, look into John Eccles. He was a guy who was knighted on the brain. He won the Nobel Prize. He wrote the book, How the Self Controls It, How the Brain, How the Self Controls Its Brain is, is the name of the book. It's, it's his, one of his last works where he goes into quantum mechanical functions and had to invent a term called a psychon to label it as the soul. And I'll just leave it at that. Cool. Okay. I would like hey, you to, know, um, oh, go ahead, Jared. 
Well, I was going to actually say, I'd actually think I want to possibly disagree with what Sai was saying. This was a bit earlier. And actually, I kind of want to second what you were saying, Kevin, about God being ill-defined. I think it is really important that we do have a, an understanding of the definition of God for us to not be talking past each other. Because I think a lot of the theists here, what we have in mind for what God is, you know, I hear some explanations, some things where people are talking about scientific advancements and learning about the origins of life. And I'm wondering if what you're hearing is a very super intelligent master watchmaker. And if that's what you're envisioning by our definition of God, or if it's something more, or, you know, what do the Christians here also think when they, how would you, you know, how would one define God? I think that is really important or else we're never going to get anywhere. Uh, I'll, and I'll then, uh, good, Zach. I think that God is a really extra, like people don't realize how easy it actually is to feel like you've defined God. Um, people don't realize how there is this phenomenon that you can prove too much with too little. For instance, let's say that Jesus Christ died on the cross and then rose again um, and and was like lifted, even lifted up into the sky. Uh, you know, you could argue because God is literally infinitely anything that we do and don't understand. You could argue that Jesus was a human being who like actually accidentally uh, stumbled upon some kind of like Buddhist power that he didn't understand and that he uh, Amen. supernaturally uh, that he supernaturally resurrected himself like and and we don't know how that metaphysics works you could just form the theory in that in that sentence that Jesus actually stumbled onto human superpowers that we don't understand and that would be a completely logical argument the argument for god is is similar a, a god could be a highly evolved fungus uh, that existed just pre bang he could be a uh, underly evolved seagull, but in a way that we don't understand, that programmed our existence into a keyboard. And he's planning on throwing away, throwing away the floppy disk of our universe after he's done with it. God is God means nothing, and it means everything at the same time. Uh, so so okay, that's okay, where... But... Yeah, but okay, so in the two examples that you gave there with a highly evolved fungus or the master uh, programmer. I mean, to me, what I'm hearing are two entities that are really still confined to uh, contingency. Um, th these are, these are things that are outside of this natural world, but it still exist in some natural world. Whereas, yeah. No, I think the God. classical view of what God is, is, is not quite that. Well, see, classical, see, what, what, what we're talking about here is um, uh, we're talking about the Western world, the Western God for most of us, I, I assume, are in the West. But that's not the whole world. And so I think I would like to see science enthusiasts jump in because he's been all over the chat. And I know he's chomping at the bit. So uh, I would like to see him jump in. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Can so, you hear loud and clear? Yeah. If you guys don't know, I'm Wayne. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, hey. But uh, should I introduce myself or should I just keep going? Uh, like, introduce well, yourself. So, for those of you who I don't know if, if any of you guys have been a part of the Great Debate community, but uh, I uh, hang out a lot with Steve McRae, Rob Hunter. Um, I'm an ex Younger Creationist. Um, now, that I, I guess you could say I'm an evolutionary creationist. Uh, I believe in God 100%, but I also accept all of the science. And uh, we've had, I, I, most of the people in this panel, we've had the chance to talk to Hugh Rawls, Michael Heiser, all these other great people. And so uh, that's basically where I'm at now. Um, as far as this discussion goes, as far as definitions go of can we define God, that is more or less like a trick question. I think somebody in another discussion, they asked me, they said, Wayne, okay, I'll, I'll can see, I'll give you that maybe a God could have made the entire world. And Rob, you were there. He said, God could have made the entire world. He said, but how do you know 
there weren't many gods that created this world. And honestly, there is no way for you to not know them, or for you to know them. Uh, there could be one or there could be many. And so what I would say is it, it's hard to define what a all-powerful God would look like, but anything that would be uh, more powerful than us or anything that would be in a higher dimension or a higher space, any type of being, whether it's an alien or whether we, we would call it something divine, that would be a God to us. It may not be the God of God. It may not be the all-powerful, but that, by definition, anything more powerful than us, anything outside of this reality of this dimension, it might not be God per se, but to, to us in our mind, that would be God. Um, so it's, I think it's more or less of a trick question. I, I think instead of saying, can we define God <clears throat> to define what is a God to us? Yeah. So, and, and, and a God to us could be a natural universe because that could provide everything that we could even imagine. So, so that is a good point. God literally has everything to do with everything and nothing. It could be a seagull, could be a fungus, it could be literally nothing, uh, and it could be a natural universe that we observe. Um, it means oh, it could be. You saying it could be another universe that spawned our universe? I mean, if we take the multiverse theory into um, consideration. Sure. Well, even be, even with the multiverse. Okay, how you, you explain that though? I don't, oh, and that's no. the that's the point. Oh well, it's that's outside the, of the dimension, so we can't imagine. We can't explain it, but it does exist. See, that's the problem with this argument. We cannot I, explain. I it, think that's a lazy answer, though, is to say that it can't be explained. I mean, why why couldn't we I explain something? I didn't say that. I didn't say it can't be explained. I said that I can't explain it. Um, but I think science moves on and knowledge moves on. So maybe one day it will be explained. Well, Actually, I, I guess, uh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Thanks. Wait, I, um, hold on. Can I add to that real quick? Because I, I think whenever serious, somebody yeah. says, sorry, just real quick. Um, I think it's when somebody says uh, it will be explained. It's almost like you're using the God of the Gaps fallacy, but applying it to science. Well, no, I didn't say it will be. I said it might be, or did I say it will be? If I did, I misspoke. No, no, I didn't um, however, it might. it might be explained. However, um, the but then, um, it, but then again, is it, how how does that follow still under the same general fallacy when you well, use that line of reasoning? No, but but we're not we're we are not apologizing or apologetics doing that thing. We're not <laughs> doing we're not doing that for uh, a fungus or a seagull. So so no, we but don't. You're but you're but doing it for the God. Already admitted that this God, yes, there are some things that we kind of can perceive, like he's nice, he does nice things for us, but we cannot perceive his actual being. And that's what, what I what you're doing that. is we can't, we can't you, use okay. the, the I was point. Say, well, I was just going to say real quick, but you're using it for the concept to against the concept of God, though. Uh, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. I don't. I don't, I don't think they are. Um, it's valid for that. I'm not saying that I haven't. Like, I. I don't think that I, if if somebody to disprove Mormonism, mm -hmm. I don't think that they have to have some other kind of. Like, they don't have to be another religion. They don't have to be something. But if we're talking about Mormonism, like, you know, it, it doesn't. If this is wrong, it doesn't mean that the world doesn't exist. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so notice notice how at the start of this discussion, I I said that this is all models that we are proposing. They are hypothesizing a lot of things. It could be yeah. this, it could be that. Therefore, that's going back, way back, uh, uh, Kevin, when you were asking Hunter about uh, Hunter's uh, dialogue with, with Pine Creek, where Hunter presupposed God and worked with that uh, you know, train of thought. The, the trail of evidence that then led on from there was the Christian uh, worldview, not anything else. Um, so it goes well, back to that. So basically, is there any evidence for an Islamic worldview? Is there any evidence for a Mormon a Mormonism worldview, a Hindu why worldview? Not? Why not? Yeah, that, it definitely that, is that, for Islam. That is, that is 
the po that's the point. We, we yeah. hypothesize, mm -hmm. we present the model, see if Islam indeed is the worldview or Mormonism and or then, anything else. And then we have to define evidence. And I don't want to go down that road because that could take us for another hour. So, um, and I do have to go, it's been kind of long, but my- Wait, But Mark, uh, can Mark quickly just say something? Because I think Mark yeah. wanted- Yeah, I want to hear what Mark had to say. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks. Well, actually, I was, I was, I was going to say to answer that question about Islam and Mormonism, um, Islam certainly has the evidence. It's called the Quran. Um, but on a serious note, um, uh, well, yeah, I wanted to comment because people kept people kept using this word supernatural, right? Um, and I, I noticed Sai said that he defines God as a supernatural being. And I think the import of that term in terms of saying God is supernatural is to actually negate something that I think his name is Zach said, if I'm pronouncing it right, or Zach. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> cool. Um, so the, the idea of something being supernatural here, it, it, I think it would have to um, fit into a particular car category of like being sublime, being majestic, um, being ominous, being out of this world, being transcendent. So in that sense, it, the, when someone says God is supernatural, of course, so you're not going to associate that which is associated with the with the profane, that which is associated with the mundane, uh, with the sacred, with the divine, with the transcendent, right? So that would deny, that would negate the, the idea of uh, the fungus being God. So I think there should be a clear delineation Right, a clear distinction, right, between something causing the universe um, and God. I, I think that's I think that's an elementary point that we should. If if uh, I mean there is quite a as uh, what's now General Han Solo, as Robert knows, there's quite a few hypotheses as he was mentioning, sort of like in the terms of the modeling of God. The same thing applies to the causation of the universe, right? But is everything that is submitted. Um, as a possible scenario of what causes the universe, can that be defined as God? I, I would I'd definitively say no. And the one last point I wanted to add on that is about but this how? words. <clears throat> Sorry. I mean, how can you make that definitive statement? Well, that's that, I'd agree that that's a little bit circular, but at the same time, we don't have any other possibility than to use predefined words and definitions to come up with a, ver a variety and range of possibilities and, al and alternatives to be like, this is X, this is Y, this is Z, right? So here are the possibilities, which one uh, fits the evidence or matches what is, uh, and then mm. examine the question. And I don't think that we can just broadly define uh, everything and anything as God, and I and I don't think that would be. And here's another reason why, a historical reason why that wouldn't be justice to the religious traditions themselves, a lot, at least a, a whole bunch of them. Well, why we do could, we care? <clears throat> sorry. Why do we care about religious traditions? Well, if if you want to discuss the whether I mean, a religious tradition is true, whether a, a proposition <laughs> maintained by a religious tradition is true whether it's you know whether such a god exists as defined as x in religious tradition y if you want to you know if you want to discuss whether that's true then you obviously you have to um take for granted at least how the religious tradition defines what it means by god uh can i make one yeah. more point and then I'll, I'll pass it to you again uh justin yeah, i'll give it i'll just make one last point about this whole issue justin i'll pass it to you um the last point I wanted to make, again, it goes back to this term supernatural. So personally, I don't think this is a helpful word. I don't think this is a useful word, uh, this word supernatural. Um, Justin, Justin, I know, sorry, not Justin. Uh, is it the... Jared? Uh, not Jared, uh, uh, our friend in the text. Oh, science enthusiast, yes. Science oh, enthusiast uh, said that he actually also, so I'm not the only one who's a Christian who's here, uh, Jared as well, possibly, I'm not sure I'd have to ask him, but, uh, they reject the category of the supernatural altogether. Now I notice science enthusiast says that he accepts the category category of being a naturalist theist. I, I reject both terms. I reject naturalism and I reject supernaturalism because I think, um, cause I think that, what we call nature is just 
fundamentally the same thing and synonymous as reality. And to, so, to, so to talk about super uh, nature, supernatural is that which is uh, beyond nature and that which is inexplicable. Um, and so I think in terms of, and this is, I think this is what Jared might be implying here is that as a, of course, anything that is denoted in that category is going to be ill-defined. It can't be defined, at least uh, not in terms of categories that we're already acquainted with. Uh, and it can't be in, uh, defined at least intelligibly when you're, and that's one, and that's one last comment I'll make. And that is, you know, when we're talking about uh, that, which is, let's call it, it's metaphysically, unconditional absolute and prime right obviously no matter what you define that as there's going to be difficulties in defining that because this is this is the cause of all causes this is the this is the primordial uh, substance that jared mentioned that defines all things that gives all things uh the, their conditions themselves right so obviously that's going to be incredibly hard to conceptualize um, yeah. But you know, anyway. Thanks for that uh, time for to say that. And oh, by the way, it's good meeting you guys, Kevin and Zach. Uh, I enjoyed listening to you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah and thanks for. Um, can I um, say my last statement, and then I need to go to do some family time. But I saw that Aaron's on the line here. But I'll just say one last thing. Um, yeah, Aaron's my fiance. Zach, yeah, awesome. hi there. Oh, hey. Yeah. Hey, Aaron. Um, and then Zach, I'll leave you alone as the lone atheist in the group. How about that? <laughs> so, well, if you have any um, atheist buddies that want to come on, feel free to send them in. Uh, I okay. can take the atheist role if you want. <laughs> hey, that would be great, Mark. Yeah, do that for me. Okay. So, uh, the, this is all philosophical, and it's great. I love these discussions. But as you know, phil philosophical arguments do not create reality necessarily, right? Um, so what I've heard here um, is... Uh, trying to blend science with philosophy, you know, which philosophy is a science, I realize that, um, but uh, trying to blend philosophy with reality, which doesn't necessarily fly, doesn't necessarily say anything. Um, Mark, talking about the supernatural, anything outside of what we know to be natural mm -hmm. is, uh, in my opinion, and I'll say this is, um, the best answer is, we don't know, but we're trying to investigate. And maybe we'll get there. And that's really all we can say. Um, we, and um, then going back to evidence needs to be defined. And maybe we can get on a call about, you know, what, what is evidence in the future. Um, and then I'm going to leave with that. But I'll say um, it's great to meet you guys. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I've talked to Hunter and Rob before. And it's I love having, uh, uh, you know, very productive, good-natured, discussions that are ad hominem free because we're all humans. We're all trying to figure this right. life out. And I really appreciate that. And uh, for those of you who uh, don't know, I'm Kevin Waddy, uh, operations director for Fully Deconverted. Um, come check out what we have going on. We have theists and atheist debates like this all the time. And yep. uh, so guys, and thank you. Real quick, you Kevin, before you go. Oh, I beg your pardon. Would you say, Jared? Where do you, where do we find you? Like a website or? Um, yeah, fully deconverted on YouTube or Facebook, okay, or okay. Instagram or wherever. Take care, Kevin. Kevin, Kevin real quick before you go, uh, I just I just okay, want to make Kevin. this I just want to make this quick statement because you said um, about philosophy and science, right? Just real quick, and then if you don't want to respond to it, you don't have to. If you do want to respond to it, you can be as quick as you can. Just leave it at that, okay? But let me just quote this. Science can provide evidence in support of a premise in a philosophical argument leading to the to a conclusion that has theological significance. How do you respond to that, if you want to? Um, why don't you send that to me and I'll think about it. How about that? Is that William yeah. Martin Craig? <clears throat> is that right? It is. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I, well, the, the way that I think... I See think you, Kevin. It would just be... All right, thanks, no. guys. Okay, Zach, you can take that, and I'm gone. So thank you very much, guys. I'll see you on I'll see you on the internet. See you, Kevin. Okay, bye bye. Have a good night, Kevin. So here's here's my question, but just uh, and maybe Zach, since uh, I guess you're the only representative left, maybe I'll direct it at you. Um, when uh, do you? Okay, first of all, would you agree with? Uh, 
Kevin um, when he just said, like, we don't know the answer to, you know, the sort of ultimate metaphysical question, um, but we're, we're, we don't know, but we're trying to investigate it. And I guess my question for you is a two-part question. One, do you agree with that? And two, um, uh, I guess my question would be: Shouldn't couldn't we even be more skeptical than that? Couldn't we, couldn't we be, be basically be like, listen, no one really knows what the fundamental fundamental axioms of reality are. We're never going to know because, quite frankly, this sort of cognitive hardware or software is completely outside of our um, capability of knowing or experiencing. Um, so yeah, that would be my question, Mike Free. Okay. Um, the first question I think that you asked me is, uh, should we give up on defining metaphysics? Is that what you... Oh, uh, sorry. The... Uh, no, sorry, uh, sorry. I'll, I'll just repeat the first part of the question. Uh, yeah, so we'll call it A. Question A is, do you agree with uh, Kevin that um, that we don't know the answer to like ultimate metaphysical questions, but that we're trying, we're kind of open to it, and we're investigating the question itself. Or, do, do, or do you th are you even more skeptical th than that sort of like I am? I'm, I'm trying to uh, piece together what you mean by because you said metaphysical question and questions, and and metaphysical can mean anything. So are uh, I don't remember Kevin asking that. Are, are you referring to when he basically said that we don't know everything about the entire universe? -ish? Like, no, he's he specifically was responding to me, and I was referring to uh, God. Sort of, usually, as you know, functions as a sort of uh, as a axiomatic or paradigmatic um, way of. Let's call it an explanation that exp explains everything else. The explainer of the explainer, right? And so I'm, I'm saying there's sort of this. I'm saying he's saying we don't really know what the fundamental principles are. I don't, whatever you want to call it, God, laws of nature, uh, metaphysical uh, principles or fundamentals. He's saying we don't really know what they are. Um, we, we're open-minded, and and I'm kind of investigating. But I guess I'm saying is. I'm saying, do you agree with that? And two, like, um, do you think uh, that we could have like a more stronger skepticism regarding that kind of like, well, we could never know. Do you think that would be plausible? Yeah. Okay. No, I get that question. No, I, I would agree uh, that we do not know uh, the, essentially that sounded like a condensed the laws of the universe or the cause of the universe. No, we, we um, are, uh, primates <clears throat> so we don't have that cranial capability to fathom literally the universe uh, we, we have been born and then we have to keep minor pieces of information um uh, be more skeptical we definitely could be more skeptical of that and saying that uh well admitting ignorance is definitely a integral thing to do uh, right. that, that's where, and that's where me and other people like uh i mean you know I, all, all you guys uh i mean not no actually not all you guys just a, a hunter and rob i'm positive you got these are the kind of guys that don't think that faith essentially has anything to do with christianity some people do think faith has something to do with christianity no i don't think that people should even uh observe the idea of faith as something that's valuable. I, I don't think anybody should do that. Uh, so in that sense, yes, everybody should be more skeptical. Well, uh, you know, well I have when faith, but it, it depends on, on what faith means, how you view faith. Well, I have faith in you, Robert, but anyway. I have faith in you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Um, so yeah, so uh, Zach, um, uh, so would you okay? So it's, I think you were granting the point that it's it's conceivable that because we're in the position we're in, you know, we have minds very similar to chimpanzees, you know, we share a large percentage of our DNA, um, and other such factors such as our uh, cognitive constraints. Um, 
and so it's conceivable right at least in your mind i think that we we couldn't answer uh the ultimate question slash questions as you pointed out before whether there's you know whatever the answer to that is um then uh if if we can't answer it um then do you think uh that this would actually and this is kind of a counterintuitive question but do you, do you think that that would give theism more plausibility in the sense that the theists were kind of all right all along in the sense that um uh that there is an ultimate mystery that cannot be answered that there is a sort of a god of the gap that can never be filled that, that there is something out there that that actually can't be uh, adduced or addressed with evidence or with reasoning or rationality or logic but it's just some it's just something inexplicable and unattainable to our cognitive apparatus would that justify theism that's a, that's a good question um i i only just i disagree i don't think it would uh, only because i would change some of the terminologies uh, that you use for the question um you basically are rounding about to to where there is a well some kind of undefined metaphysical question that will like like it, it sounds like uh we'll never be able to understand why this we exist i i am actually one of the people that does doesn't think that why is a logical question because it 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 provides no criteria of how you would be able to answer it uh, saying why, why does my dog exist is not, it, it's very different than saying how. And I, I, I appreciate the answers of how. Uh, so, so I, I basically what, what you're getting at is I'll, I'll like explain it in this sense. Humanity, I don't think it presents anything about theism because humanity has been, we have a tendency of uh, putting characters into positions uh where we don't know what something is so for instance i am of hawaiian descent uh, i know a lot about uh, the uh, the pele goddess of the volcano of hawaii um the, the ancient hawaiians did not understand how volcanoes work so every time that this hot and very painful liquid would shoot out of this uh, rock they would say wow, somebody is trying to hurt me and provide more land for us at the same time. Uh, we have a tendency to, to misinterpret this and say who instead of what, or, or why instead of how. Uh, so when, after you see a movie, uh, a horror movie, and you're walking down the street and you have the sensation that there's a nasty thing that you just saw in the movie behind you, that's not because that exists, but our minds are taught to say who. And why is this thing to me? But that is, I, I don't believe that that's actually how the universe uh, but, should but, be. That was, a, that was an amazing answer. I really like that. And I'll give it to you in just a <laughs> sec, Robert. But um, okay. just, just to respond to, uh, to Zach quickly. Uh, Zach, so he, I, I, would, I totally agree with that answer, except that I take it to an even larger extent than you do, right? So you're saying... Um, the human mind is kind of prone to um, interpret that which is a sort of how or what or natural phenomena with a personal explanation, with, with a sort of why explanation. But my, I guess my question to you would be, uh, for when it comes back around to your turn, would be um, then how can we think outside of any of the psychological categories of language that have been exactly. imposed upon us since birth um and then <clears throat> and then so we you know I, either in other words in this in this scenario you either have you either have why there there is a why or there's some there is something personal or there isn't something personal so i mean right there there's there's two possibilities right there's something personal there's not something personal um and and how would you know if if it's a mystery? How could you possibly, as which I've sort of been kind of hinting, arguing, hinting at arguing, um, how could you possibly know it doesn't belong in the why category, right? Uh, as as one question. So my my point, and I'm trying to say my argument, sort of vindication, um, 
of theism is that th at this level of reality, theism appears to be right, that we, we can't use um, normative explanations like the idea of the volcano and the lava and the rock, you know, we can't use normative explanations. What, what we're kind of resorting to is which resorting to a kind of a psychological impressions and the categories that we're already familiar with and we can't explain it in terms of any other categories that are outside the scope of our imagination. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave that for when, you know, when it's your hey. turn to answer. Mike. Hey guys, I, I got to get going. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would definitely use what Mark was saying and, and what I want, what I was trying to get at with defining God is I, and this is sort of what Mark was getting at is you kind of left with two options at some point when we're talking about metaphysics and it's either you can't trust anything and everything is absurd or there must be some metaphysical grounding for existence in metaphysics. I mean, if memory serves me right, I think it was uh, Aristotle who would kind of loosely defined it as, you know, just the nature of existence, or, you know, the study of existence itself. Um, and so if we're working off of that definition, uh, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure, but what... You know, yeah, sure. No, kind of I, I, I actually been, agree with that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, kind of what I had been going back to is, you know, you can't posit some advanced fungus or a programmer uh, because at some point th those things have to explain their existence. Um, if they do, then you're, you're kind of left with a, a situation where you're, you're, you're no longer in a place where you can make uh, logical thoughts. Um, That's a good because... point. I, if, if this is a challenge, I will accept it and I will create the logic that would have to come <laughs> I if like that gets... answer. Yeah, no, if that's a challenge, I'll create the story that would have to, the theological the, 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 I, I'll make one quick comment on that, and, and, and that is, I think that's what everyone's been attempting to do is sort of create their own sort of logic. And as I'm sure, you know, propositional calculus and predicate calculus, and it goes on and on, but we still, no matter what so-called languages evolve naturally or ones that are invented or logic, none of them uh, actually have access to, to those very questions. And but why? Because all of the psychological categories that we're accustomed to are conditioned. And there's no, there's no way outside of that loop. So I, w I just make that yeah. brief. Yeah. And be before I go, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So before I go, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to get at, and I'm not sure how clear it is, but uh, I, I'm desperately trying to avoid brute facts, and I just don't see how you can avoid it unless you either take the option of we can't trust any of our cognitive thinking or theism is true and you know I'll, I'll watch some of this later but i gotta go so it was it was great meeting take you care jared yeah, yeah. See you, jared. thanks yeah. for coming in. um just quickly I, w I wanted to add on what mark was getting at uh, in, a, in a very succinct way because the key word here would be superstition when you mentioned the volcano in hawaii and by the way coming from hawaii recently earlier this year i saw oh, yeah. a um a depiction of exactly that the volcano god oh my god <laughs> there's a there was a um dude a Christian... i hope you got a photo <laughs> it provided all of the island for us i mean it did it did a lot for us well i saw i saw artwork where a christian missionary a female i think this was in the 1800s erin may because erin lives in hawaii uh, i went to see her and uh i forgot oh, um... her name now Pele. Say again. Pele. Can you? Yeah. Is it possible if you can touch on that? Because um, basically, she stood at the volcano yeah. and. Yeah. Go ahead. She's just, you know, the god of basically the lava, the volcano, and throughout you know the Hawaiian history, they've had this god, and there's other gods too. Um, and a lot of times people will even say that Pele has told them to come to the Hawaiian Islands specifically. So there's a lot 
of people even here today that still, you know, believe um, that, you know, Pele is actively and, you know, getting the volcano going and that she's like unleashing <clears throat> her wrath to everybody just recently with, you know, all the homes that were lost. So, mm. I mean, I could, you could look her up. There's a, a lot to it, but. Yeah, it's fascinating how they attribute all of these things uh, to her personality, a personality that just, that just doesn't exist. I mean, it's not a matter what, of. What, what, we, what, what I wanted to bring up. Without it. It's a matter that she doesn't actually exist. Yeah, like, but I'm not. Well, the thing is, um, you know, throughout well, history, there's all these gods, right? And so if there wasn't something actually happening, then why would these people be believing that? And so I, I totally agree with I that. Think and it's that's, really that's more why we like have a demonic or just other spiritual beings that are involved, you know, and so they're showing themselves through things or telling them, you know, otherwise you can't really explain how all these gods have come about and people thought them to be so real. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, yeah. I want, that, just, just quickly, Zach. Uh, what I want to say is, uh, we don't need to talk about the volcano per se. What I wanted to say was, when I was there, I was fascinated to see that there was a story of a Christian missionary that defied oh, yeah. the superstition of the Hawaiians, and so this is something that you see throughout the biblical literature as well. When Paul himself tells the Galatians that you were once slaves to these elemental spirits of the universe and he's speaking about the planets in the night sky because the wandering stars in their eyes were gods mm -hmm. and paul says they're not gods he explicitly says that they're just natural objects in the sky so this this type of reasoning against superstition which again is part of evolutionary psychology i find it curious that christianity is the dry force against that which is a good thing because that's exactly what atheists want people to do and that is not be superstitious you know to make to make this mug a a divine being for example go ahead how do you make the jump to where christianity doesn't look like all of the other things that it looks like i mean how did you make that differentiation where okay let's say that a let's say that literally anybody a mormon uh, said they they a human being could muster just the intelligence enough to say that other gods weren't real. Does that have anything to do with whether or not theirs is? This, this relates. This relates to the discussion at hand from right at the start, because as we, as I spoke about how we all develop models, and then when before Kevin had to go, I, I made the statement that mm. Islam is a model, Christianity is a model, Mormonism is more, Hinduism, and so on. The Christian worldview is explicitly saying. That the that these things uh, revolve around a superstitious, primitive perspective. That that it's it's not a true way of going about reality. So the lo the whole notion of the logos concept to think rationally is that is the uh, epistemological drive that Christianity wants everyone to have. Yeah. So when you when you gave the example of a volcano and how humans then make a superstitious uh, worldview out of it. I find it interesting that Christianity, a so-called religious worldview, is the is the rational reason why we shouldn't even be superstitious. It it actually it, it's the, well, the only religious force that says to do. Let's uh, let's just observe that Christianity has claimed that other religions are false. Like let's let's just observe that bare minimum. Uh, he said, Paul said, uh, you know, these are false gods. Well, he didn't say they're false gods. He's saying he doesn't deny the existence of other gods. What he is doing is the superstitious application of certain objects, natural phenomena, basically. Natural yeah. phenomena in the universe is not the result of spiritual entities. Wait. I I thought that you just said the opposite to that. I thought that you just said they were. They maybe were Mark, maybe you can maybe you can explain what I'm trying to say. Well, um, well, but, but basically, okay. Let me um, let me. I'll try my best. I'll, I'll try really fast here just to give Zach the opportunity to respond. But, but basically, Zach, basically, if you can think of the natural universe, and then de de, de it, 
Um, basically, yeah. you're you're stripping, you're diminishing and stripping away the parts of pagan religions that have imbued it with properties that never really belong to it. Right? Exactly. And so, so the Hawaiians that divinize the volcano, Christianity says, don't do that. Okay, okay, okay. But what if? What if? Let's let's just. This is a crazy hypothetical. And and then I actually want to answer what Aaron I think said. Right. Like, Okay. Um, what if uh, the divine lady Pele said not to divinize Christianity? Does that mean uh, that, that she's so logical that we can't just even understand how smart then we, she is? Then we compare the worldviews. So that's a challenge that she provides. And then that's let's see if it's coherent. Okay. okay. So, so what... <laughs> Okay, so Aaron basically pointed out a good a good uh, line of logic that said, since this thing has been happening for so long, since people have basically been getting this thing wrong for so long, since the beginning of time, really, we, like it or the, no, uh, excuse me, since the beginning of our like perceivable history, we can find really early religions. So people have been getting something inevitably wrong. Um, so. I don't see how that points to one of these things being right. And for the reasons of like, and she basically pointed the question, do, do we have an explanation of why people are doing this other than that there must be some uh, metaphysical thing outside of all of their delusions? Well, well this, this uh, yeah, goes- yeah, We actually do have so many explanations, natural explanations of why people do this. We have anthropology, we have, so many reasons why cultures develop icons and then attribute their sense of morality, their sense of personality, their sense of social reform into these icons. We we have all that research. Right. So yes. But you have but you have scholars who work in the missionary field and for example Don Richardson has two books, one called Peace Child and the other called Eternal Hearts, where he showcases pagan cultures to be Quite, quite along the, the same lines as a Christian rational perspective, where they may not have the Bible, but they do hold on to non-superstitious ideas, but yet at the same time attribute their logical reasoning to a particular Logos uh, entity of some sort, which is, again, a that. Christian worldview. I just, I just wouldn't say that Christianity doesn't uphold to, I mean, if you believe in Christianity, it doesn't hold up superstition. I mean, but, but that's, that's where we have to, yeah, I mean, I actually so basically, think Christianity is more Christianity is more natural, <laughs> or well, I just don't think so. Okay, for instance, like uh, our our friend RC, like I don't know who he is, you guys do, but we talked to him. He was saying that um, just when you look at the Bible, it holds up to the logical laws and the moral, like what we know to be moral moral law and what we know to be. And what I'm trying to get at is that. That that is not true. This is like like for instance, like and this is again, this could open up this ridiculous uh, portion. Uh, atheists typically, I can't speak for everybody because we don't have any kind of like doctrine or interpretable text that we could go on. But like we, I don't. I'll just use myself as it. I don't think that the Bible is right in shaming homosexuality. And, and somebody else can look at that and think, oh my gosh, this character told me that, and it's so much smarter than I am that I should listen to it. But, but Where does the Bible me, say that it shames uh, homosexuality? Like, uh, it's, 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 it's just, just these blanket statements people? that... No, it's just these blanket statements that... Yeah, you just need to nose. provide the evidence before just plainly saying something essential. Wait a minute. So are you guys yeah. saying that Christianity is pro-homosexual and that has no problem with homosexuality? No, I don't th I don't think anyone's saying it's pro-homosexual. No, 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 no one's saying it's pro-homosexual, but the, the insinuation, the insinuation is that you're attributing um, the idea of homosexuality, the condemnation of homosexuality that some Christians promote, you're attributing that to some sort of superstition of Christianity. And what we're trying to say here is that actually there's a lot no. of modern scholarship and there's a lot of modern re research, especially that uh, I believe Han and Aaron have looked into, right? And they've looked into it and they've actually seen the real reasons why 
which have nothing to do with what you know young young earth creationists and those are promoting but yeah go ahead the the anti-scientific no i mean the anti-homosexual scientific research is that what you're talking about no, no. no. <laughs> sorry, sorry, man. No, it's 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 because we're saying the totally opposite to what you just said. But yeah, go ahead, Han. No, go go ahead, Zach. Basically, you, there's no shaming of homosexuals. What you do see in the Bible is a pro-monogamous male-female, you know, context with respect to what marriage should all be about. Okay. Whenever yeah, homosexuals yeah, are discussed, I find it curious. That this is something that I've presented and I've written on. Actually, I've written a blog on this. Lesbianism is nowhere mentioned in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Only men are mentioned in the Bible, like as far as sodomy is concerned. Uh, yeah. The Bible is silent on lesbianism. But that, does this mean then that uh, homosexuals get a green card through, like a free pass? No, it doesn't, because Jesus was explicit about man-woman relationships. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is, is you guys perceive these words to be infinitely wise uh, of sorts or inspired by something that's infinitely wise but my point is that this this not only is subjective it is culturally induced uh to to have this response to the text Mm -hmm. uh, to to feel like it it is so smart like uh, my buddy steven he's a theist and we we talk all the time on the uh, poly deconverted group he said that the most powerful and the most influential verse like uh, the just the most intelligent verse in the bible that you could think of was i am and and this is this is what i'm trying to get at with this proving too much with too little information like i i'm just I am a human being that has never and will never meet the invisible character that will never speak to me in this book, okay? I understand that there are uh, psychological capabilities that human beings have where we can talk to each other. And I understand, do you guys know what a tulpa is? No. Uh, A tulpa is an ancient uh, Tibetan practice that they used to think was spiritual where you literally, um, it is a practice where you create a spirit, but it's telling. You're not, you're not creating a spirit. It, you, you define, and you write it down in a script as well. You write down in your own personal book what your topo is going to be. You just define what kind of characteristics it's going to have, it's, if it's going to be nice, if it's going to be evil or jealous or greedy or uh, clever, witty. Uh, you define uh, what it's going to look like. Does it look like my chair? Does it look like my dog? Does it look like, uh, you know, uh, something down there? Or you can find whatever you want it to look like. And then you meditate on it for ever so long. And, and the Tibetan practice, uh, the, the people who were uh, doing it at the time, they found that, you know, after meditating on these characters for so long, these characters became real. I mean, uh, they, they talked to them. They had uh, intimate relations with these. It was an artificial intelligence built into the brain, and people can still do this. I'm actually a person who has done this in the past. Um, it, you know, just so quickly, I, Zach, this I, is, I, I know exactly where you're going with this, uh, because this is no different to the, uh, the, the thing that was happening in the early, um, from the 70s onwards, uh, um, Christian scholar named Dave Hunt actually wrote on this called the seduction of Christianity that this type of practice entered the church and now has become what's called the word of faith movement where you have a placebo idea of a god and you you know you you imagine certain yeah. things kind of like opera's the secret I, basically I don't want, I don't want to, everything yeah yeah uh, I don't want to like add it on it's no to different to that. I don't want to add it on to Christianity. I want to analyze it next to Christianity. Right, but I'm the, saying I'm saying Christians did exactly that, and Dave Hunt said, "Don't do that because that's not how you ought to be as a Christian." So well, I find it interesting that that practice is similar to what happened recently. But are are you able to like point like notice how there is a script? Just as the same in the Tulpa, because you have to you have to be reminded about what this thing is, or else like you. You can't just keep on like 
coming up with it by yourself. People in countries that are not exposed to uh, Islam, they don't know what Allah looks like. If you're not exposed to Christianity, you don't know what this being looks like. Mm-hmm. So, so that that's my point. Like, my point is that we have this capability, whether or not people like want to say that their religion isn't it or not. We have this capability to perceive things that don't exist. Um, we have the capability to write these things, beings down into books so that we can memorize how we feel about them, how we should respond about uh, them, how we believe that they interact with the world and whatnot. We, we have that ability. Uh, independent of any other, like, we, there is nothing that is, there's nothing that we can prove is like, uh, inspired this kind of ability and it. it's neurological, it's biological. So my point is this Christian being, this Jesus, this God is never going to speak to you from, uh, apparent, like apparently speak to you, it, it is never going to speak to you from your birth to your death. And, and this book is literally the only way that we could perceive something that is not real. And, and that's where I'm, coming up blank is where like because i i believe me i was a christian i do understand theology like you know i i could have answered those questions that you guys were asking Sai. like oh do you think god is supernatural no I, as a christian i would say no uh, my theology says that uh, god isn't supernatural because he literally is the the mind of existence well, when, you, being when you were a christian but, but, sorry aaron when, when you were a christian uh what was what went through your mind when you read about John one fourteen about the Word becoming flesh and tabernacling among us? Mm, good question. Because that what? that is ex, that is explicitly the 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 the, the, the crux or the fulcrum oh, well, of the Christian was... message relative to the other religions. Because here God is interacting with humans directly. Well, let's uh, say let's not say that it's different from other religions because many 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 can't even emphasize that anymore uh religions have deified beings that have then become flesh no religion has incarnation except that is not true what are you talking wait excuse me wait what are you what are you saying exactly that okay so this tulpa uh example you just gave is no No. different no religion has what the incarnation so when you gave this Buddhist uh, example of a spirit manifesting in a, in a certain presence, the ancient Near East had the exact same practice. They call it the opening of the mouth ritual where they would make an idol and then they would have this entity and dwell the idol. This is why the Ten Commandments says, don't make an idol that then demons can you know, go in and so on. And don't make an idol out of Yahweh that you can tame Yahweh in one of these idols. Okay. I, but I see this mean, notion but... of Yahweh tabernacling and interacting with humans foreshadowed the ultimate tabernacling, which is the direct, physical, empirical, tangible experience of the Logos in human flesh. I, and this I is known as... That's Jesus. Yeah, so, right? so that's, you won't find any religious superstition in the ancient Near East leading up to first century Christianity and beyond. Even Islam rejects this, that this, this notion of the eternal Yahweh God becoming uh, becoming finite and, and, and a creation. Okay. Um, so, um, so, yes, no religion ever has had, other than Christianity and Judaism, has had Yahweh turning into a human and coming to the earth. But, yeah. but, uh, so many, like uh, if I need to compile a, a list of just the just the main ones that I, I even know about, which would be a decent list, uh, there have been several. I mean, are you claiming that no human being has ever been deified, uh, or or that no? It has nothing to do. With, it has nothing to do with theosis or deification or glorification. You're talking about. Uh, and it's it's a model that I like. It's called neo polinarianism where the eternal wisdom of God, the Logos, uh, is able to incarnate and tabernacle in human flesh. So so basically, this goes back to the dualism perspective. Do is the brain like just a chemical because composition? We're saying the same things, but the 
we're saying the same exact things. I'm saying Jesus, and you're. This sounds like a word fetish where you're saying other words. <laughs> that's the same thing, but you think it means we're not saying the same thing. I'm talking about Jesus, a incarnation of a deity coming down to earth and all this. But on. Jesus, it Jesus is not throughout history. Jesus and it's sure, not, if you believe in it, that's the only one that ever happened. But no, no, no. Jesus is not theosis. Jesus did not. When he became flesh, he did not experience theosis. The theosis part was after the resurrection. Explain mm -hmm. how you think it means something different than that one, like the other one. Because so, God, yeah. so God had to literally experience being birthed through a birth canal. God had to literally experience breathing, eating, going to the toilet, uh, getting sick blood flowing through his veins uh, he was a full human being he there's nothing there's no ontological specialness about jesus jesus was as human as you and i are he could experience the flu virus if he, if you know the okay. flu virus was around I, I think what you're saying is that your theology is slightly different than every other religion because it is a different religion therefore it is true it, it leads to the fact that if that's the case, then God indeed did come on earth yeah, physically true. True. In, in every, in every manner uh, imaginable. That's the whole point of Philippians 2, the kenosis of Christ. Well, no, I, I totally agree that if it's true, it's true. I totally agree with that. You can't so, disagree. So then you can't then connect that with other religions, like as if other religions had the same concept of incarnation as the Christian gospel. No, no, you, you can exactly, because notice this. Notice how we are talking about a theological conversation right now, and, and we have both observed one idea of theology and the other. So to say that that is outside of the purview of what, can, what human beings can imagine or, or even claim is a strange claim. I mean... Uh, it's, it's a, but humans can't come up with the Trinity, and the humans can't come up with this this what? very complex perspective of neo Apollinarianism of how the Logos fits in that. Only after that event takes place did, did the theological discussions then just drive off into how do we explain this? Well, humans did come up with the Trinity, and it was no, because didn't. of it was. Have, have you guys ever noticed? Um, like how DC movies are basically at this point in time uh, correcting themselves off of their mistakes, like of the last one. Every new movie is basically an attributed thing of how bad the other one is. They just try to like flip it around. That if you if you research the history of like the Trinity, it's basically that it's like okay, no, this this doesn't really work. It doesn't really make sense. Let's try to make sense of it. No, some, something that's that revealed. Doesn't... Something was revealed, and the model of how to explain mm. that mechanism is the human conjectures. Yeah, I mean, point. I mean, just to cut in, the the map is not the territory. Quite frankly, I mean, you, you can't exactly you, <laughs> to, to say to, to state to state it simply. The map is not the territory. So we would we would actually agree with that analysis. We don't see a problem with that. We don't see a problem with a. Uh, theology that develops and refines itself over time um, and, and this is sort of as Han might suggest this is sort of what happens in the scientific um, endeavor itself right Han like with the, obviously with um, with uh, Newton and Einstein and the and some people argue it's a falsification but some people argue it's more like well he anticipated it and uh, you know you know like yeah, that's, that's that's a gripe I have with people who say that science changes all the time and actually no Newtonian mechanics just had an upgrade with respect to Einstein's yeah that's what that's that's the view that I take as well yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I totally agree that our human primate species does evolve by our thought process I I completely agree with that I can disagree in any way because but, yeah. it's just reality. Go, go ahead, Aaron. The, th the thing is, if other people were deified, you need to have evidence for how they were deified and I agree. You know, the context and all that. So you'd have to present that, like just, you know, say, okay, there's another yeah. being that, person that's deified. Yes, and this, so, is where basically, this is where we all agree. I disagree, excuse me. And, and you know, I, I know that, I know that Rob, has done a lot of research and you, you all probably have done some research. Um, this is where we honestly just disagree. And, and like we've kind of touched on the existence of or the definition of God in the talk, but 
I mean, that that's a completely other talk about the gospels, the epistles, and what we can use for evidence and what whatnot. And and that's where I don't mm-hmm. think that we can move forward in the conversation tonight. We, we could offer each other some literature and authors and ideas and whatnot, but like the I don't think that there is uh, even even an approximate amount of, of pleasant evidence for Jesus. I don't think that there's even a tiny reason why people should actually believe that they know that he exists. Not, not to say that there are not some uh, lines of logic and pieces of evidence that would like, suggest that maybe a person uh, might have started at the Christian movement or multiple people might have started as inspiration for it. But uh, that, that's just where we disagree. I, I think that all, all of the other deified messiahs, all of the other answer prophecies, all the other um, similar instances uh, are equally unjust. Hang on. So can I just question you about this? Are you saying that Jesus did not exist or are you just saying there's a lack of evidence that he existed? Well, no, uh, I, I will not say that uh, some character did not be deified, um, because I think that would be unintegral. But um, no, I, I think that the evidence in the epistles and the gospels and the contemporary evidence outside of that is not reliable. And, and that's, uh, that's I, I know that's a claim that people don't, uh, that you, this group does not agree with, but um that's uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, yeah, I'm a little hey. bit perplexed. I'm a little, oh, sorry, Aaron, go ahead. Oh, sorry. What's the ultimate basis? I mean, what are the primary reasons off the top of your head that you, uh, there's, say there's, there's you know for sure you do not exist? Well, no, I, that's what I just said. I, I don't say that there wasn't any person that was deified. I don't say that. <laughs> uh, not, you know, atheists, atheists have a wide variety of expectation on that. Like, um, no, I, uh, what, what I have, uh, studied has just been this, this, uh, area of scholarship just, just lately, you know, I was a Christian for 20 years and I've done both sides of the, uh, study. Not, I probably haven't done as much Christian perspective study as like someone like Rob, but, uh, nonetheless, I have read uh, many theological, uh, you know, so yeah. would, would, would you agree? Um, Can I? W- w- would you agree that um, that your position here is in the minority? Like, are you no, aware? I, hmm. Are you aware of that? Or that's, that's a difficult question because sixty percent of uh, well, this is approximate sixty percent of um, Christian biblical studies is faith literature. So, so there are forty percent that are are not faith literature, and that actually. Um, I mean, Rob, Rob will probably be able to tell you, even within that 60 and 40 difference, there, there are so many differentiating uh, views on the ev- evidence uh, of uh, the Gospels, because there were 2,000 years ago. You guys have to kind of give, give that its due respect. This is 2,000 years ago with different writing styles, different historical contexts, different languages, different social aspects and stuff sorry like where, so, where are you where are you getting the 60 40 statistic from did you did you say it's called bible studies uh biblical i didn't, studies. I didn't biblical what study did you okay mean, uh, what, what is biblical study if, if you don't mind me asking and, and what do they have to say about this 60 40 statistic um i will have to give you guys uh, the the um scholar that i'm talking about he, he did um I did experiments, or not, not experiments, but statistics in biblical studies, just all around, like, uh, colleges and whatnot. Um, yeah, that, that's why I said approximately. I don't, that, that's uh, about 60% of people that publish work in Christian scholarship are Christians. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, which, which is like, which is like trying to, to go over to Islam and then say, well... You know, <laughs> aren't you a friend follower in Pakistan? Like, if you're a Christian, well, yeah, okay. yeah, you are. I, I, I have to, I have to say that that's a completely false analogy, yeah. and there's a good, there's a good reason why. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, what I'm saying, what I'm saying here is, you're right that there is a such thing 
as Islamic scholarship. But the problem with that is that Islamic scholarship has not been secularized and it's not part of a mainstream academy, to, to be quite I, frank. And I agree that that's a problem. Excuse me? I agree that that's a problem. You can't really oh, get Oh, you agree that that's a problem. Yeah, so what the reason why that's a problem is because what how they use that when they're debating uh, with us Christians is they say things like, well, even your own scholars acknowledge that your Bible is corrupted, right? So, so they have sentiments yeah. like that. Well, that um, and and so what, what they're actually doing when they actually say that, what they're not realizing is that there is no traditional Christian scholars in, in the sense that they have traditional Islamic scholars. What they have is a hegemony of scholarship, tradition, and power, right? But in the West, it's completely different, at, at, at least since the 1920s, um, you know, and also since the time B.B. Warfield, etc. What has happened in the academy is that the academy originally became liberal Protestant, and then slowly liberal Protestantism was also ousted, and it became more and more secular. So when, when we say here that X amount of Christian scholars or X amount of Christian historians uh, – what not believe that Jesus existed, right? We're not using the same reasoning as when Muslim scholars say, well, we know Muhammad existed. We're using a very different methodology. And I think the methodology is key here. Uh, that's just the first point I would make. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, so no, you're right. I, I'm, let's, let's just rewind. I'm not trying to make an appeal to authority. That's, that is actually not what I'm trying to do. Um, and, and I'm not trying to suggest that that is a way of logically thinking about things. Um, there is a, well, let, let's just, uh, I'll, I'll say it this way. I've, I've been drinking a lot at this point. Uh, there, there are, I can't name all of them at this point, but there are like uh, so many scholars that, that uh, have been forming in modern times, uh, just books like uh, The Power of Parable, uh, The Mystery of Acts, the uh on the historicity of jesus uh so many of them have pointed out how well, let's let's just start with I, just this conflict zach i yeah i think I, i'm not gonna boast here but i have a whole google drive <laughs> of all the major literature that from from both christian and non-christian alike so for example i have a non-christian work called the erotic life of manuscripts or the, the erotic life of the New Testament, where it, the title is that the title of the book is is deliberate, where now they're using phylogenetic studies from evolution and applying it to textual criticism, and so the interesting Wait, so thing about the thesis of this are? book, sorry, what does this have to do with? Like, it's related uh, to it's related to this claim that. Uh, oh, we have non-Christian scholars, and they're writing on the histories of Jesus and the New Testament manuscripts, and whether all this is legitimate or not. What I'm saying is, I can I can pick Christian new evangelical scholars like Peter Gurry from a New Testament context. He he's a Christian. He's a he's a uh, uh, an Orthodox Christian, but he will not allow that bias to then mm. enter his his scholarly work and that's exactly the point i was making rob exactly so uh, just, just to repeat i just want to yeah. make us sure here 100 percent. so what i'm saying is when is when such and such scholar in the islamic world says we believe that muhammad existed based on the evidence it's not equivalent to when we say xyz scholar in the secular world who happens to be a christian is saying that this is the evidence that Jesus existed. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm saying there's a disanalogy here when you appeal to the Islamic uh, criterion. So that the scholarship. I'm saying the systematic that's, methodology of the scholarship itself is disanalogous, right? That's, I think that's point number one, and that's absolutely crucial. So when we say so, here's and this is what I'm trying to get, and I'd like you to respond to this, Zach. So don't worry, I won't be too long. Um, uh, the point I'm getting at here is. When we say X amount of, of, of such and such uh, Christians in the field, and these Christians are, believe in the historicity of Jesus, right? When we say that, we're not saying the same thing that we're saying about Muslim. We can't attribute this, these Christian scholars with 
uh, the sort of biases and the sort of methodologies that promote and favor their own systems of thought that we can say about the Islamic Academy. Do you get the point? Anyway, your mind. I, I do understand that, that there is a cultural difference between America, but that that also is a very big statement where we can't attribute the same biases. There are there are actually some biases that we can like commonly attribute to different religions. So, but but that's that really is like that's kind of what I was trying to get at. There is uh, what you could okay call okay, but but we can, I, I noticed the word I used there was the same biases. I'm not saying yeah, that secularists course. don't have biases, but it's it's crucial that we acknowledge they don't have the same biases because, for yeah. example, Christians okay. cannot go to to the, the literature of the ecclesiastical authors or the patriotic sources, and they can't say, ah, we have this is Nad, we have um, we have Eusebius and he takes from Augustine and and then we, we know he's reliable because of this circular reasoning, such as such and such says such and such is loyal and such and such says such and such is dishonest. This is this this is completely disanalogous to when we say the same biases. You, you know what I'm saying? Hopefully. Sure, sure. Well, I, I will admit, a lot of Christian scholars, a lot of them, and this is just period, a lot of them don't have those biases. Some of them do. A lot of them don't. Uh, so what, what I was trying to get yeah, out of but the Which is, ones in the actual academy that are authoritative Jesus scholars or historians have the sort of biases that are relevant to the discussion of whether Jesus existed. Like we could, that would be that would be like we, we can contain that. We've act, we've literally we've blockaded that off. We have a section in you know in ecclesiastical history where we have Eastern Orthodox theologians, and they believe in different things because they separate their professional life, their academic life from theologically what they believe about Jesus, right? So this is what secular Christians do. But I'm saying in the Eastern world of Christianity, that's that sort of behavior is not as prevalent. It's, it's sort of like what you get with Islam. Yeah. Where the theology dictates the, the data as well, rather okay. than the other way around. Exactly. Um, that, so, I mean that that is a that is a bias that cannot exist in Christians carrying out that, secular scholarship. That's, that's, the, problem with, the problem with this is that we okay. are talking about a an, a big analogous bias, and and I mean that doesn't really say anything for or against anything. And and I wasn't necessarily saying that there is a huge, massive, big. Uh, cultural bias uh, the same that is in pakistan the same as in there but well, i mean i mean i, apo I apologize if that's not your opinion it's just that the the view that you take if you actually look at the people who advocate the view that you're advocating like the the prominent one is richard career that's exactly what he says he, that's exactly literally yeah. what he says yeah. he's he, right. so i understand i apologize hey, if i misunderstood hey, you don't be by the way richard Carey is in the room right now no, he's well, not. If, that's, that's not him, right? I mean, no. Yeah, that's <laughs> well, the real that's Richard Carey, please stand up, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, okay. Back back to the point. Is, no, I, I don't just... Uh, I, I don't know how to ex explain this exactly. I don't just read one person and they're like, oh, that's that's super... I just want to believe that. No, I've, I continue reading. Uh, so far, I have found... And this okay. is just, and I, I do actually think, I do actually think that you guys have not read the same things as I have. So we have to trade literature. You know, that's just how people have to. Right. Uh, that's why we have yeah. discussions. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so oh, that, that's, so I, that's, that's, I have yeah. actually read things about the Gospels and, and about the epistles that are so damning. And, and we'll have to trade these things. Like, because if I had read, maybe if I had read the things that you guys have read, I read, then I would think, oh my goodness, that's not damning at all. You, but, you see, you see, Zach, the same things I have. Right. I, I'm not, I appreciate you saying that. And I want every Christian to hear what you just said, this, what you just said. And that is to be a critical in your evaluation of things. So uh, I don't want Christians that go to you know church every Sunday. I don't want them to just read pro-Christian literature. It's good to see what the best critical evaluations there are in, in the world out there. So for example, 
Richard Carey's work on the history of Jesus. It's a 2014 manuscript. Uh, um, he hasn't written anything since on that. But so it's recent, basically. Mm-hmm. And I think it's the best. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's the best attempt in utilizing the scholarship that has come up until that period that he finished the work uh, to give his uh, hypothesis that Jesus is a cosmic entity and not a physical person. And so therefore, you know, Jesus didn't exist. I and, disagree and, with his, with his uh, conclusions because when I look at the literature, there are things Richard Carrier has actually missed out on and people like Hound in this room is well aware of the literature Carrier has missed out on. So, but the point is, I haven't. I'm not afraid of engaging that literature, and Christians should not be afraid either. Yeah, yes. I just, I just hey. want to quickly say, just to reinforce the point you're making there, Robert. As a Christian, I go to university, and the only literature that I read uh, opposes my own views. That's literally all I read is literature that opposes my own personal worldview. Right. So, I mean, on the off chance, I do get when I'm, you know, when I'm not at university, I do get to read people who agree with my views. But for the most part, the the vast dominant majority of the time, I'm I'm reading the opposite, the opposing views. So, just to reinforce your point, who who are your people that you go to for those opposing? Uh, I'm just just curious because I I like to hear authors full science. Uh, do, do you do Bartram and? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I yeah. I love I love Bartram and myself. <laughs> yeah. And and do you see just fallacy on through his work or, or just, just just quickly on on Bart Ehrman. So Bart Ehrman is uh, he's agnostic uh, as far as I know, maybe atheist, but I, as far as I know, he's agnostic. Uh, as far as textual criticism goes, he's obviously debated um, Wallace on that, and. The Erotic Life of Manuscripts book that was released in 2014 um, by a Japanese student in phylogeny, uh, she um, proposed, why don't we use computer simulation models, uh, like, you know, just just embed a, a special type of software that uses those phylogenetic models and apply it to mutations in the text. So, and, and, and related to the 5,000 plus manuscripts. Guess who wrote the foreword and review of that book? It was Bart Ehrman. After that, after the research of that book, Bart Ehrman has now taken a more pro, you could say, Christian stance on the New Testament. Beforehand, he was when he wrote was, about when he wrote about misquoting Jesus. He was all about oh this problem and that contradiction and and so on and so on, and then he's just blown away with this new type of research because of, thanks to evolution. So here you have people like Bart <laughs> Ehrman. So the point, the point is, here you have people like Bart Ehrman, who's written w- with a particular point of uh, point of view in mind. In this case, a negative point of view in mind about the Christian faith and and how the the, the New Testament was transmitted. Oh, yeah. And but with the best of the data he had at hand. Now, not even six years later. Five or six years later, after the publishing of that book, which was in two thousand and nine, he's changing his mind about it. But he's still an I'm agnostic. Fascinated. He's he's not a Christian yet. I'm fascinated by what you say. I, I need to hear what his thing was on it because I mean, he, he is a skeptical dude. I I can't. I mean, uh, if if that guy were to say, uh, "Wow, holy crap, I missed this. I'm a Christian now," I would be like, "Oh wow, I need well, to check." Oh, he he, do, he does he does say that he says I'll that Jesus that. existed, which contradicts your view. Yeah, so I'll, and I'll give you. I'll give you always thought that there was a no. I'll give you one more example. No, he's and, he's always maintained that there's a historical Jesus. That's literally yeah, he's, he's, he's never changed on a, that. Yeah, he's never been a I Jesus know. guy. Which which I've taken into good. I'm not a person. I'm not a person who will say I do not. And I've said this in in this talk. I I will not say that I don't think that a person was deified. I'm saying that it is a possibility because I've seen other instances of, of people being deified, uh, even against their will at times. I'm talking about how data, if, if you're honest with the data and you don't hold biases and Bart Ehrman's, have, and actually, to be honest, I, like how Marx said, I, I like Bart Ehrman too. I like his scholarship, even though I disagree about his choice in the Christian context. Yeah. Here's, here's another example. And Mark actually knows this back in the Pal Talk days. Um, 
when we when we debated Muslims. Bart, uh, Muslims use Bart Ehrman with respect to the <laughs> deity claims of Jesus. In 2012, he released his book, How Jesus <laughs> Became God. In that, in that, in that book, yeah. in that book, because of his look into Second Temple theology and the two powers in heaven idea, he changed his mind and then finally conceded mm. that the Gospel of Mark is a thorough defense of the deity of Jesus. Mark chapter 1. <laughs> well, not just that, but Mark uh, chapter 14, the whole, like, Jesus comes on clouds, he's a cloud writer, and yeah. all that language. Ba yeah, basically, that's a, that's a, uh, a, a, big part, a big part of his argument is that you look at it collectively together. Um, basically, you know, in his original argumentation, he was saying isolated these events can be explained. So, for example, uh, Jesus' ability to uh, forgive sin, he would say, well, Jesus is functioning with the authority of a high priest, and so therefore, you know, the Unitarians can sort of um, re-explain that in, in the with the light of Unitarian theology. But then what happened to him, part of, part of what happened to him was that he just saw the accumulation of the evidence uh, rather than looking at it as an isolated case, you know, because you, obviously when you read a book, um, but it has an intro. It has a bookend. Obviously, the, sometimes the two match, and it has a, it has a theme. And so basically, he just he just saw the rig, the rigidity uh, rigidity of the uh, of of the cooperation of of this sort of evidence. But um, but even more interesting, even like listen, uh, here's what I'll grant you. I'm so dude compared to these guys that we're chatting with, Zach. I'm even more liberal, to be honest. So I'll grant you everything Ehrman says, excluding theology. Excluding theology, everything he says, every position that he's made, I'll grant you that. And then it's you can because, tell me. It's because Mark is al haq <laughs> <laughs> You can tell me. Even I'll even grant you the even grant you, you know, Ehrman often I don't know if you know this, Zach, but Ehrman contradicts himself all the time. Um and it's not just by the way, it's it's sorry. Well, that's all. It's all good. It's not just by the way when he's updating his views. That's obvious that he's that he's updated his views, and so it's not necessarily a contradiction or a negative one that he's he's changed his mind. But there's ones that are unintentional, is what I'm getting at. So I'll I'll even grant you the most liberalistic view you can get. Um, the the fact remains is even when uh, even when that is the case, the question remains: Is the historicity of Jesus disputed? It's not. Um, is the his, is is the evidence of the New Testament as a whole um, is still uh, admitted as viable evidence as and and has stood the time of tenacity as well in, in terms of uh, in terms of the historicity of Jesus. And one way of by the way, one way of comparing this, if you, if you want to take it take it an example of a real historical figure that we do know exists at the time, like say Pontius Pilate. We know we know Pontius Pilate existed at the time now because we've literally we've actually found an inscription. But if you actually go to the uh, the contemporary period where era where he existed, and you actually um, analyze what is the literature within mm. Judea within Israel in the first century, which historians reported his existence? The answer is none. The answer is there's no contemporary witnesses, not even and well, not even a footnote. It's not just that there was no historians. And and what's amazing, as Ehrman would point out, for example, is he would say, um, this is incredible because you would expect what with the sort of powers um, that Pilate had in terms of in terms of his his role um, as Pontius, you know, you would think that there would be tons and tons of evidence. You'd think there'd be loads of it, but it's scant. It's even so. To if you want to place Jesus in the realm of history, to 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 compare him side by side, right? To say that a an obscure Jewish rabbi walking around the um, the rivers of Palestine um, would be recorded even on a mass national level is a non sequitur historically. It is a complete non sequitur, and this is not something that I've invented. This, this you know, this is not something that 
me as a biased Christian made up. This this is something that you can find in even yeah. disbelieving sources. But yeah, go ahead. I, I will take that for for what it's worth. And I, I do understand that people hold to that belief that this like and this evidence is conclusive. I, I will I will understand and grant that a lot uh, a lot of people believe that. Um what I mean, well, first of all, I, I don't, you know, as, as far as I've never studied pilot, I, I don't know what evidence goes into that. So I can't really say either here nor there about that. But, um, you know, I, I think that we should actually plan a date where we go over our independent theories of the gospel, because what I'm, what I'm wondering, if I were to ask you, uh, what like certain mythicist uh, uh, arguments are for Mark? Would you guys be able to explain them to me, or or would I be the one that would be explaining them to you? Have you guys really gone in depth uh, to to understand what people have criticized in, in Mark? Yeah, I've, uh, I've gone to I the from the chiastic structure. I, I'm not claiming to be omniscient either. So if if there is something I don't know, I'll I'll admit yeah. it and I'll look well, into it. I think that we should actually plan a date where we we get together and and talk about like uh, I you know maybe we should do a separate epistles and then maybe the gospels uh, time and stuff like that. I well, mean, th there's just one problem with this, and that is, and you and you know this is probably as much as we do, is that there's there's no monolithic uh, mythological theory regarding uh, Jesus. Yeah. Right. Oh, I, each yeah. each mythicist is of a very independent thinker uh, when it comes yeah. to their own. Uh, varied reasons why he uh why he is a myth um yeah. which so, you'd agree okay cool yeah. and i think that there are so many and this is this is actually i think is a big problem there are so many fun myth series there are so many very stupid ones that i've heard and i've gone oh wow that's that's actually ridiculous like one i get as annoyed as any christian would get annoyed when people try to relate uh, like jesus to horus or something like that i I'm just like, guys, stop you. This is embarrassing. Um, like, yeah, I, I think <laughs> so what, so that's, a, that's a good so one. I like that. Yeah, so what's the best one you've heard? Well, well that's that's actually, I mean, um, that's that's why I think that we should go through the whole thing. Uh, in comparisons, I've heard many, many fascinating comparisons, just not not in the sense of that, not in the sense of where people are saying, oh, you know, because this is something that people, I think, is a common misconception about syncretism. Syncretism is when, you know, uh, you guys probably know, just when, when beliefs are influenced by others. Like, we are, when we're looking for syncretism, we're not looking for Jesus of Nazareth that the Greeks believed in. You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're looking for icons, uh, concepts like virgin births, dying and rising, uh, salvation, disciples, eternal life, stuff like that. And and uh, there are some, uh, especially surrounding that time, uh, like all surrounding the Persians, the Romans, the, uh, the there were several deities that, that uh, are not around now that, that um, but that's not why. That's not why I believe that the gospel is a myth. That wouldn't ever be why. Yeah. Again, um, I, I'm sorry, Zach, but that there's there's parallels of the twelve disciples, which, by the way, correlates with the zodiacal cycle because you have twelve no, constellations. Not, none of that is uh, what I. Think. No, 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 no. I'm saying, I'm saying, the New Testament. The reason why you have Jesus choosing twelve disciples is a response to those type of things. So you have the virgin births. The, the way the Magi find out about Jesus through astrology in 7 BC leading up to a 3 BC birthday. The, everything that's laid out in the Gospels. In fact, uh, just last night when um, when Hunter was talking with Doug and then Doug mentioned the 5,000 being fed, just that figure alone is a response to the Hermes uh, uh, myth. And and just the, the way the story is structured is, is a response to that. So the mythicist claim then that there's a borrowing or a parallel from other traditions that also have a virgin birth and also have 12 apostles and, and all yeah. this. Uh, that, that's Everything in the New Testament is unique to the New Testament. 
I would agree. <laughs> I would agree with what you're talking about. I'm not actually yeah. saying that uh, the Gospels. I'm not saying that the Gospels uh, take a mind from uh, you know these other dying and rising gods. Uh, but okay, for, but for there instance, are no. But the thing I, is, I, there are I, no dying and rising gods. That's what I, I, I think. I think. I think he's trying to get an irony here. It would be like just to give a, an analogy. It would be like um, someone looking at the Gospel of John and being like. Hey, look here! The Gospel of John is advocating Gnosticism because there's clearly some information uh, embedded inside containing Gnosticism. And of course, the irony of that statement is that the Gospel of John does have an anti-Docetic uh, polemic, an anti-Gnostic polemic, and the embedded word into flesh? it. Um, well, you'd have to also you'd also have to uh, question which branch of Gnosticism because they they weren't exactly a monolith either. Um. So just to finish that point, so um, that would be like, like look, go, opening up the Gospel of Mark and being like, or as a, or even we could just stick to the Gospel of John as as I said. In term, we can in even use Mark because McDonald has said Mark borrows from Homer's Iliad. And fine yeah, yeah, that. absolutely. I, I, and I, and there's a lot of yeah. other mythicists that have, have made that point as well. But what they're not seeing, of course, is, <laughs> is because if if there's something from that. In fact, the New Testament does this to such a great extent that you you would be surprised. So I'll give you an example. You know the um, um, Paul on Mars Hill, right? Yeah. Um, where he's quoting the Greek philosopher, um, I think it's Epitomes. I, f I forgot his name. But anyway, if you actually look at the original context of the quote, Han, I swear to God, it's... it's, 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 it's yeah, it's Zeus. It's, it's attributed to Zeus. <laughs> right. Um, and um, and the authors, uh, the authors are actually literally endorsing this approach. They're saying this is a good approach because there is an element of approved of syncretism. This doesn't, of course, this doesn't negate historicity. Uh, this doesn't negate uh, the traditional theology. The, the on, you know, the only camp of people I can think who this really refutes is the mythicists and the young earth creationists who, you know, happen to be literalists about this. So, no, you can't quote a pagan god, not in my babble, you know? <laughs> no, of course, it refutes them too. What about I totally agree. We we cannot uh, disprove history with that. Absolutely not. I mean, uh, definitely. Um, but see, see, the problem here is like I do want to. Uh, I'm I'm in the process of learning so many things. Uh, I would like to show you guys like what I mean. Uh, there, there's actually like complex. This is what it is. It's patterns, uh, literary patterns that that the Greeks were taught at that time how to use and how to alter ironic uh, story uh, no how to ironically alter stories and how to do this certain thing um like if you were to find out let's just say uh mark would would we all agree that mark is the original uh god um, like the, the first gospel that yep. was uh, yeah yep. okay. i'm but, definitely but the then, first gospel but then even even scholars like alan garrow will say the didache is the basis for Old Gospels, okay. which is a very interesting theory. Are you talking about, or... Who? Are you talking about the Q Gospel theory? Or... No, no, he's Q... talking about the Didache. The, I'm talking about the Didache. So the Q is... is so Mark Odeka has actually done a good job refuting the whole Q hypothesis. Yeah, but, I, don't, I don't think it's a real thing. Yeah. Right. So, uh, but the Didache is a very interesting theory because you have in Acts where you have James having a council and, and they, they even the Apostles' Creed is based on that. So uh, is it possible that the Didache is the basis for... So you have, you have a Didache, which is a very short text, and then the Gospels are nothing but extrapolations of literally all the theological details in the Didache. And that's a very interesting theory. It, 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 Mark Didache has actually debated Alan Garrow in September of this year. Um, I'm waiting on the um, the uh, you know the transcript on that to see what happened, but uh, it's an open it's a, it's an open door for me. But either way, the point is Mark would be first, definitely not Q, possibly a Didache influence, and that's okay. it. Okay. Um. And and what if this is just another hypothetical? And I, I know this like <clears throat> this is for the next debate. Um. What if you guys were to find, um. 
that mark was written in a in a way that is historically verifiable that, that people were writing back then what, what if you were to find out that he was writing just completely symbolically to to mine the old testament of what uh, it was prophesying and also to n not only provide like i think like scenes that are contextually more explained by symbolicism and lack of periphery i would say that that's exactly what we would expect in a greek bioe so i i don't see the issue in fact we would in fact i already grant that point to be well, to be quite this, frank this way of uh, writing was actually used not only to mythicize historical fig figures but also historicize mythical figures so that's that's also where we have to be critical of it it's like th this was literally used to fabricate a social change and you know religious function can you can you just off the top of your head can you think of any characters in the gospels or the acts of the apostles uh that are the examples that you're looking for not you know not just in terms of deifying yeah. historical fig figures but actually outright fabricating the figures yeah actually let, let me give you guys an example of a scene and rob i'm very interested to see if you have something to correct me on here um okay okay so i think it, i think it's mark 11 um about where they have what what uh I, I call it a ring, uh, a sandwich, a story, which is a literary device that Greek authors were taught uh, to write one story that wraps around another story that, that, that the understanding of these three stories are contingent on the ring, on the sandwich, okay. So, so at first we have the story of Jesus walking up to a fig tree and killing it. Uh, do you guys recall the the generic a story where okay yeah. they, they go yeah, up there, they're they're walking. Walking. yeah they're walking up um jesus like sees a fig tree the disciples actually say oh look there's a fig tree and it's out of season so it's not gonna bear fruit and jesus walks up to it okay and, yeah I'm, a, I'm aware of this yeah yeah mm -hmm. okay let, let me walk through it though so that like we can we can deduce whether or not this is best seen as history or best seen as allegory. So, so they walk up to the tree. G the disciple announces that it's not in season. Jesus, a being who can just magically produce f food whenever he wants, decides that uh, he wants to kill the tree and that it'll never bear fruit again. He says, this, this tree will never bear fruit again. So the scene cuts. They walk to or they appear at the temple and that is the scene where jesus cuts off all trade to all like he doesn't allow anybody to enter or exit the place he turns over the tables uh and you know it, he's the destruction of the temple that's the scene that i'm talking about and so and then immediately following that they walk back by the tree and the disciple is like wow like the, the this tree is withered from the roots up. So my thing is, at, at first glance, we, we cannot really logically deduce why Jesus would walk up to a tree that he made that is out of season and then decide that it needs to be killed. I'd but agree that, with that, that. that. yeah. That, that doesn't initially make sense. So, yeah, but when sure. We, when we get to the next scene in the, uh, in the temple, what we have to understand about the historical like context of the temple and the, the cultural context is that this temple is many acres wide. This is literally a massive plot of land. There is a community inside of this, a trade industry inside of this. There is, there is actually an army surrounding the temple that, that we actually have signs, like the uh, archaeologically verified signs that are saying that this militia outside of the temple will be able to kill you if you disrupt the temple. Like, they, they will come and, and attack you. Um, so so what, what we're seeing in this scene is not, it's lacking periphery. And, and what we have, if we think this is a historical event, 
we have to think that Jesus is doing like is basically looking like this uh, like this Superman or X Men Jesus who is like one fighting off an army, uh, blocking anybody from coming into several acres of land, and also turning over tables, uh, also fighting off the like hundreds of people, vendors, and all all other kinds of things. Or, or we can just understand that this this is this fig tree is talking about Jesus walking up to the temple that is out of season. He's saying that this this can no longer bear anything that we need. We need to like destroy this. This is going to be withered so that my new uh, you know my, Jesus is replacing the temple. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting cold. Um, Jesus is replaced. I don't know how to frame this call. Sorry. Anyways, um, well, just just well, a quick point while you're sorting that out. Um, so what I heard, what I heard there was pretty much a false dichotomy. You can believe X or you can believe Y. Is there not like a third alternative? Well, no. I no. Actually, I'm I'm only asking you guys if you are trying to picture this as history. Um, okay, so and, let's let's lay out the variables then. Only on what it says. Only on what it says happened. Jesus walked in. He starts mm -hmm. turning over tables. He yells at people. But this is this is like. So did you say Mark eleven or John eleven? Mark. Okay, so. This would be in Mark eleven. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I, I so I'm I'm not it. sure. So uh, Mark, to correct me if I'm wrong here, but Mark eleven has Jesus. Turning over tables? That's the fig tree part. Um, well, I in Mark 11, I, that, that uh, might have been, that might be, I might be grabbing something oh. on that. Uh, hey, hey, yeah. hey, guys, I got back on the, the chat because oh, I, I saw that you guys were I still on. You can say, I got a piece so bad. <laughs> okay, I saw that you guys were still on, but um, if you take, um, I don't know what you guys have been talking about, but in this example, the two or three different versions of the story. Um, yeah, he turned over tables, he used a whip, he drove money changers out of the temple, he prevented um, egress and ingress um, to the, from the temple court. So like Zek was saying, you can say, um, well, that actually happened, um, or the likelihood of it not happening is really strong. So, I mean, I saw Richard's on the call. Uh, do you have anything to say about that, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> he thinks it's yeah. the real one. Yeah, Carrie, what, oh, what do you think? Oh, is that not the real one? <laughs> <laughs> How funny! I man. wish. Yeah. Um, no, it's the real one. It's it's as real as you can get. I'm the one that that really matters, actually. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, at any rate, uh, there's it with the size of the temple grounds to say to think that that happened literally is beyond probabilities and in spite of the fact that we know that these are literary devices that oh, have wait, 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 wait. how how is this even how are you even making the claim that this is this did not happen in history well well okay it's just a matter of probability is is magic more probable or or is a known literary again this goes back this goes back to our discussion on the water changing to wine the, the point of the story is the fact that you have israel in the past being depicted as a vineyard and yahweh is the viner and so jesus acting in yahweh's role is judging the uh the sinful state of the temple which again the temple is all about god's uh indwellment and so therefore the fig tree is a lesson that only jews will understand no no greco-roman person would understand the, the the symbolism behind the fig tree situation of course of course and so you can have that lesson without thinking that that was a literal event yeah. and when you look at the story you can say okay there's no possible way one man can prevent entry especially with a roman um, guard around. Yeah. Let, let, um, let, me tree... add, let me add just to that exp explanation. This this is just like I, I wouldn't expect anybody to be a 
convinced on just this one scene, right? Like if uh, I told you, oh, there's one scene and, and it could be seen as symbolic. No, I, that's not what I mean. The, the fact is that uh, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to allude to that there's massive amounts of literature on how the entirety of Mark is this way uh, to where it actually, it is not necessarily, like you can see it as historical, but if you put historical context into it, it, it is not apparent that it is that way. Just just like the scene of uh, Pontius Pilate and Barabbas. There's, there's, uh, I would like to get into that more at some point. Uh, but, well, I see. This is where I, I mean we can just easily disagree. So th this is what I mean before when I said like false dichotomy, right? So um, you can have it as you're trying to say as a plausible literary mechanism. Um, that's <laughs> fine, but. I don't see the problem with the initial intuitive absurdity that you were trying to impose. Basically, basically you're saying uh, ostensibly um, that it appears absurd, right? And I'd agree with that. At first glance, it appears absurd, but um, it doesn't. Yeah, at first glance, it does appear absurd as from a literal perspective. But for example, I'm just looking up Craig Keener here, and Craig Keener says this quote. So this is, this is specifically regarding the narrative of the fig tree portion. At Passover season in late March or early April, fig trees are often in leaf on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives. At this time of the year, such figs contained only green early figs. Arabs to this day, they call them hachish, which ripen around June, but often drop off before that time, leaving only green leaves on the tree. A leafy tree lacking such early figs, however, would bear no figs all of that year. So in other words, uh, just through the usage of his, his own personal empirical senses, he could tell, he doesn't, in fact, he doesn't even need prophetic knowledge at this point. He would be able to tell that a, that a fig tree uh, was not going to um, bear the figs that year. And this this is just off a basic analysis of, of the natural science as it is. So, you know, it's, it's things like on. this where atheists automatically um, pass off something and right, saying, well, is this or is it this? Well, it's, all of a sudden it can be both, right? Well, now, I'm, not, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to say I have an explanation for every verse that you're going to provide off the top of your head, yeah, but yeah, certainly I'm not omniscient. <laughs> well, well, that's actually not what I'm saying. I, I'm actually asking the question, how can the evidence be interpreted with more reason instead of with more ad hoc? The, the, the point well, is... No, no, no. If you remember the question I was asking you, right? The question I was asking you was specifically if you can give an example um, of a legendary sort of embellishment or, or a character that was outright fabricated. And um, maybe you didn't hear the part about, uh, I was specifically asking for a figure mentioned in the Bible, which is fine. So you just appealed to a literary narrative of the fig tree instead. So what I'm saying is, how do you know for, how do you know for certain, again, so all, all of a sudden, you know, we can give this a, the context of a kind of a naturalism that atheists don't have a problem with, and all of a sudden it becomes 10 times more plausible, right? Um, so I don't know how you brush it off so easily. No, no, that's, that's exactly what I'm trying to say that I am not saying. Uh, that I'm not trying to say that I can only bring up one tiny thing and then convince you. That's, that's actually... Uh, you asked me for one thing, so I, I like kind of went into one tiny thing. But that that is like as as anybody like we can all agree uh, if we've read a scholarship on something, then it, we can name one tiny thing. But you do actually have to read the extra or you have to read what it's wrong because I I know I can't convince you I, even if I even if I show you you know several other scenes that are more interpreted like it's um, I I'm a student. So I, you know, I, I can only point to the curricular like activity that would that would uh, be needed to understand what I'm trying to get at. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with your answer about having a fully comprehensive, evaluative view. I, I think that's fine, and I, as you said before, I think we can have an independent conversation about that. It's no problem. But like, I mean, do you have an example? Just, just 
off the top of your head from i'll make this more explicit from a character in the new testament that we know doesn't just have uh, added con um legendary connotations embellishments right but is an actual myth other than the character of jesus is is there any any character in the new testament documents that you think other than jesus that you think enters into that category how about okay. mary or, or great, Lazarus? Great question. great question well that that's the thing okay let, let's think of other well let's not think of christian authorship let's think of other either religious or mythical content um are there mythical characters in there yes but i i personally would never be able to uh prove that romulus didn't exist uh i would be able to hypothesize how he didn't just like i am able to hypothesize about how mary didn't but i i no i can't actually yeah well we're not no, no one's actually looking for a positive disproof of you know of a uh, certain oh, yeah. historical yeah. characters exist what we're looking here for is the what historians do and historians don't look for proof or certainty they look for probability yeah. right and they look for what is the best explanation of the data so that's yeah. that's really all we have to go on here either the mythical jesus hypothesis is has the best explanation is more plausible the historical jesus um hypothesis has the best best explanation is is more plausible I, I, one of the two is more plausible but i mean so you i don't think i think what you just said is you don't really can't think of anyone off the top of your head inside the new testament but i think you're saying for you that that you understand romulus and Rem, remsus are completely fabricated and that they couldn't have well, that the best historical explanation is that they, there was no historical existence of either of them. Yeah, well, I, th my point is that um, I don't think that we should approach the conversation in such a way. I, I don't think that I should disprove characters that I have not seen proof for. Like, because I don't think there's any way to do that actually because and just well, like i mean it, I, I i mean as i said before though don't you have you've got two possibilities here as you kind of said at least two at minimum you've got two um and that is either romulus that is plausible that romulus historically existed and then some elements about him have been embellished or there was never a figure the figure itself was posited in the first place as a sort of a mythological uh, literary tool or device in order to enhance the legends and myths of the Romans, right? So, I mean, are you saying that you have a position on that, or? Well, I I actually do think that. Well, um, I you know th th with this, I'll, I'll have to completely admit I'm I'm echoing what I have heard from a wide variety of uh, scholars. I, I've never done a Romulus study, you know what I mean? Um, but I have gotten the impression that there is no backlash on the idea that uh, Romulus is a completely fabricated character. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I again, like, I would not be able to disprove. Okay. Any okay. So, story. are you are you basing that on the basis of the fact that these are credible scholars with expert oh, no, okay. opinions, or do you have reasons? I'm agnostic. Uh, somebody, somebody literally, I, I've learned that there was a character that people did believe in way back when. I have also learned that nobody in the modern world believes in him. I don't exactly know. Why. Okay. But uh, I've never done a Romit study. That's what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure why people say that. But um, so far, I kind of have that inclination to okay okay let's broaden the discussion like you said before like is there any other character other than jesus that you know for certain well not for certain but for in terms of the best explanation is that they are mythical or is this just a sort of special oh. pleading that applies to jesus exclusively no um well no it, it doesn't actually apply to jesus exclusively I, i'm saying that there are actually so many characters in the gospels uh that and and even in the epistles that we th there is actually no reason to believe that they existed other than the gospel so i don't know how i could discredit those characters but i mean i will say i will say actually this that 
the gospel has no problem, and even the character of Jesus in the gospel has no problem with creating characters, because this is parabolic teaching. So, for instance, he created Lazarus. Lazarus did not exist, uh, but he's telling a story about somebody who did not exist, but that we should gleam a philosophical insight from. So, I like even even if some people thought Lazarus existed, which they don't, because it's it's known as a parable. I wouldn't be able to disprove Lazarus existed. So, I'm not exactly sure where the character. I mean, and where the well, character, well, just just the assertion. Just the assertion that he doesn't exist is in itself a non secular. Oh, Rob, uh, do you disagree with that? I had no idea anybody disagreed with like that. That Lazarus, the parable that Jesus told, was. Uh, I, I didn't. No, want. you. No, no, no. You said you initially before you clarified yourself. You were saying it's just a parable. Lazarus didn't exist, well, but we can still use truth out of it. My best impression. Well, I mean, I just so just from basic conversation with you about general ancient history or, or the period of antiquity here. I, I mean, there's you seem to be agnostic as to any potential historical personage as to whether they fit the whether they fit the explanation of this is a legend or this is a myth or, or this is you know you seem to plead well, ignorance here, but you do seem to be, and this is quite. Uh, ironic or, or quite um, what's the word a peculiar to me yeah a peculiar is that you do relegate Jesus to that status um, well, yeah, that's why that's why I'm trying to very adamantly argue that we should actually have a talk on the Gospels because the, this is the presupposition the, like the, the presupposition that the Gospels are accurate is what you guys are talking about when you say the name Jesus. So I think that we should first do this. But because if if Jesus existed, then literally nothing that I'm saying makes any sense. And I do agree with that. Like I can't. Well, can disagree. I say something, Zach? I yeah, think that Jesus um, is a special character because of what's claimed about him. Yeah. I mean, so when you look at historical figures, then uh, from from what I understand, I'm not a historian, that there's a presumption of um, of existence apart from any kind of uh, probability against. <clears throat> so when we look at, especially Jesus of the Gospels, there's such a huge probability against that Jesus existing that the default has to be, well, unless we know, unless there's evidence that he, that, that Jesus existed, then we have to assume that no, that he didn't exist in that way. Okay, well, now, what, what about, what about the, um, sorry to interrupt, what about the, the, Caesar of Lucius, who underwent apotheosis and ascended to heaven. Well, and then obviously we would have to say, and that's a good question, that that particular Caesar didn't exist. But we have enough evidence, from what I understand, that the real Caesar did exist. There's, we have yeah. his letters, or letters to him, that's, and other scriptures. Yeah, Caesar but there's, no, there's not. What I'm saying here is that all ancient literature is similar to the gospel in this respect that there's there's no there's no such ancient literature that does not have some sort of legendary embellishments about okay. about um such yeah, individuals sure. like caesar i, I want to i want to like echo yeah like, lucius verus that is not a myth he actually existed yeah okay uh, i want to mm -hmm. echo exactly what you just said to to try to look at it from a different perspective and lens um you just said that in ancient time, it was extremely common, natural. Uh, this is what we should expect people to do, to mythicize characters. And then you use that as a logic to say, that's why I believe that we should believe in this context of this ancient time that appears to be mythical. And I don't, I don't get that jump. I don't understand, because you're saying that this is basically a time in history that is essentially unreliable because they mythicize so much. And and then you're saying, so we should expect the truth to be mythicized. And, and that's where I disagree. Well, uh, here's, I, don't here's, I don't know where you got that assumption from, but who said that if something is mythologized, that therefore it is unreliable? No, no I didn't get that. That's I, I not what he's saying. Yeah, no. I, I'm, I'm saying that's literally that, what he just accused me of saying. Yeah. No, no. I, I'm not saying that if something is mythicized, then it doesn't exist. Because I know that, you know, like characters like Alexander the Great, 
and Genghis Khan. They were not born of virgins, even though people believe that they were, and that they, they were mythicized in that sense. I'm not saying that. Myth mythicization can happen to unhistorical characters and historical characters. What I'm saying is that you're pointing out how the Gospels are written in a time where mythicization was the norm, was the naturalistic form of what is popular to do. And you're saying that because that was so popular that we should believe this thing that looks like a mythicized version of events. And I don't agree with that. I, I don't think that is what I'm saying at all. Uh, I don't know how you got that, but... Um, okay. But, uh, okay, so um, let me think here. So well, Mark, what, I've, what, I've actually, what I've actually said is that the mythologization of historical figures does not denote their, um, does not denote their historical absence or does not denote that the best explanation of these characters uh, is that they are purely mythical. I agree. Rather, yeah, you, what, it, what it's... Sorry, are you relating this to Jesus? Yeah, I'm relating. I'm relating. I'm relating this. I'm relating this to all of these characters in history. All of them. There's, there's no. I'm not. There's no special exemption. There's no. There's no special pleading or or any or anything like that. You can. You if, think that Jesus was mythicized? Sorry. So you think that Jesus was mythicized, or are you not putting him in that category? Of course he was. Of course I believe that there's elements of Jesus were, were mythicized. We just we don't. The, 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 there's, there's a semantic you should be aware of. I don't know if atheists yeah, are that I, aware I, of it. No, I agree exactly with what you're saying. If something mythical happened about something, uh, we shouldn't disregard that as historical. I, I completely agree with that. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. We can we can we can agree on that. Um, all right. Basically, so that would Mark, be the I have a question for you. Well, well, I'll just quickly say this in the, in the humorous role in our modern culture today. There were trolls back then as well. <laughs> that would, would <laughs> mythicize Jesus in such a way that it was just for, for a laugh. Actually, I, yeah, I've heard that, Rob. Um, so, Mark, I have a question for you because I'm kind of late in the game in this conversation, but. Are you you said that you believe that Jesus was mythicized to a certain degree? Um, do you believe that? So obviously you believe that there was there was this historical Jesus who was mythicized. So the question for you is how to what degree was he mythicized? Um, are the well, gospels I, uh, okay, the mythicized sure. yeah, version yeah. of Jesus, or are they the historical version of Jesus? Yeah, sorry. So I need to before we continue, I need to clarify exactly what I mean by that. So um in scholarship and outside of scholarship there's a just like for example and you can kind of conceive of this so just like um outside of scholarship if you use this if you use the term cult it it has a negative connotation right but inside of scholarship when you use the term cult there's no negative uh, connotation it's just referring to the usually the genesis of a uh, religious sect and and its uh, linear history. So in in the in the same way, when people say in the in the populace, they say that often, especially from atheists and internet online skeptical communities, they use the word myth, right? So it has a it has a negative connotation. But from the my background, when we say when we say myth uh, in sociology, etc., what we mean by that is the stories we tell each other. That's what we mean by myth. But I, to be even more specific, um, there's another nuance in scholarship, and that is uh, a modern distinction, but it's, it's probably worth noting because I think even a lot of mythicists would agree um, that there's a difference between a character that undergoes the process of legendary embellishments and then a character uh, that was his, his, historical, and we call that a legend and then there's a difference between that and a character that had no historicity at all or has not even been assigned historicity in the first place like uh, uh, uh you gave an example before like lazarus he's uh, at least in luke 6 it's not clear from if we uh, agree with you that that's a parable it's not clear that he's been assigned an actual historicity um so i i would agree with that so there's a distinction there so you're asking me in what sense am i saying or what degree am i saying jesus is mythologized 
Um, for me, I think there's a, I think there's a sense, uh, and this is sort of what Han Solo, uh, sorry, my friend Robert, I used to calling him Han. Um, this is what he would get into as well. And so what what we would say, we would acknowledge, for example, that the ancient Near Eastern views uh, influence the Bible um, to uh, basically have their own unique ancient Israelite cosmology that was integrated into the Bible. And it's not synonymous. Um, it's not synonymous with modern science. Um, so when, when we say, so Max. for example, I'll, g I'll give you one example, and then I'll hand it over to Robert, because I know he's really keen to comment now. <laughs> um, oh, so one, one example would be the example uh, of the Carmen Christi, or even places in Revelation, where it says things like, every knee will bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. And of course, under the earth, people are like, huh, what, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, of course, that can refer to several designations. It could refer, refer to Sheol or Hades or Gehenna, or it could refer to the Great Sea. There's, there's a range of locations. But the idea here is that even though the Bible is using a sort of a, uh, you could call it a myth of, of cosmology or cosmogony, um, the Bible is is trying to relate the scope of something. It's it's saying in this instance, it's saying universally, every knee will bow. But in the context of the ancient Near Eastern context, uh, that is inf that is also in influencing the New Testament. It's saying that in the terms of the language applied to the period, right? Um, so that's what I mean when I say things like, well. You know, Jesus is seen as glorified and exalted, and he's sitting at the right hand of God. But you you look at that, and you're like, oh, yeah, there's a literalism that they believe to that. But then you look at it more closely, and you're like, oh, okay. There's not just a literalism. Like, it's also denoting, like, everything and everywhere for in the context of the submission to Jesus, for example, or in the context of his right hand. What is it denoting? The context of his right hand, it's denoting his equality with God, that he is enthroned besides God. So, again, it's ancient language, but it's denoting the second person of the Trinity, for instance. So that's what I mean. But, yeah, go ahead. Uh, is it Rob? Go ahead. Basically, uh, I mean, I don't really need to add anything on that, but, but to paraphrase what Mark is trying to say, you have uh, humans 2,000 years ago and another 2000 years prior to that. So even at the time of Moses and even prior to that, um, humans thought differently. They had a very unique way of thinking. The way we think today, ironically stems from Reformation Europe, basically the, the rise of the scientific method. And so that then led the way f for us to communicate and think the way you and I do, which is radically, obviously radically different to say an ancient Egyptian. To give you, you know, just to reiterate what Mark was getting at, questions like why the sky was blue would result in answers like, well, since the ocean is blue, therefore there's an ocean of water up there. And then what, then the next question they'd ask is, well, what holds the ocean of water? Well, then there's a solid dome and on it goes. Mm -hmm. So the point then is that the biblical text if God indeed is communicating to the authors, and I don't believe for a second that the Bible is a mechanical inspiration, uh, inspired text, meaning like the Quran, where it just falls out of heaven. The Bible is completely human in its origin, but God in a, maybe through epiphany or some sort of providential influence uh, will dictate the right things to say at the right time. And that's why you have people like the prophets that, are in that category and the message is coherent and consistent from the early texts leading up until the new testament era not just among, within the theolo theological scope of what it's trying to communicate but also the cultural context that's going on so the bible is very consistent with its original cultural context and what we have to then do is acknowledge that and uh give respect to those ancient cultural perceptions of reality i would totally disagree it's, it's um, very odd hey I, I, would, I would totally disagree with the consistency argument um but again it's like late not i want to get into it 
I don't, I don't I, believe I, it. I, I, you know, I, can I, I would actually agree with so much of what you said. You actually said that it's the writings that we have for biblical that, that actually made it into the canon. The writings that we had are in accordance with their time. And I, I don't actually even, I can't even imagine a situation where they wouldn't be if they're written in that time. Yeah. I, I can't so, even imagine and, a situation where they and wouldn't I'm saying be. That, I'm saying that as a Christian, which many Christians in the room would agree with, because there are Christians that unfortunately give I guess what I'm trying to say here is that there's some instances where I think that the the text is using the language of myth, but it's actually denoting a reality. To to be quite blunt, yeah. That's, yeah. How do you differentiate from that? Like, let's say, it's, it's a de of what's actually going on. So Re Revelation 12 is a clear example of say the Apollo myths. And the many other myths that you know the woman being chased by the dragon and so on well, and yet me... there's an actual astrological fact that took place in 3 bc where we can pinpoint yeah the day exactly of Jesus birth. yeah good well, example let me um let me try to like grapple onto what you guys are basically positioning um you guys are positioning that yet yeah, like the these books that have come from a certain time can be related to their time they can be kind of like identified to be there's uh, what you could call satellite markers of uh they're they're basically pointing to that they were written that's around actually satellite. a very good way of putting it. i like that analogy the satellite markers yeah. so i'm going to yeah that's good that. yeah okay but let's, let's also go on this um and and uh i'm sorry is it mark the second voice that has been yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, Mark, you you're pointing out that people have used our anthropological mythical language, our development of mythical language, uh, which mythical language is known to be kind of a cold reading device, a, a, a way to show that you know more than you actually do. And the the, the problem with that is that we can take uh, let's see, and and I know that like this can go into other debates of, well, the, you know, okay, I'm going to use a, a Greek instance, uh, which I'm not, I'm not apologizing for Greek theology. I don't believe in it, but I'm just going to use this as an instance. Um, no, excuse me, Norse, Norse, uh, I'm sorry. Um, the, the Midgard serpent uh, could very well be interpreted to be global warming. That, it, it wasn't, though. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like uh, it, it could vary. The idea that in Ragnarok Thor is going to battle the Midgard Serpent, it could be uh, a scientific argument about how the sun is going to become too hot for it to to sustain our life. And uh, but it's just not. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, wait, did they actually make this attribute of the weather? Water? Oh yeah. That's a no, no, that, that's my point. Like, they didn't say that, they just said that basically Ragnarok, the end of the world, was mythically going to come by the, the serpent uh, strangling our globe. And, and you can mythically interpret that to mean so many things, including. Uh, the, the sun becoming too hot and, and supernova. Well, I, I think you're I, th I no, think that, you're sort of stretching it here though, right? I think you're well, stretching it if we what no, what I said was what I was said was in plain language was that in the ancient Near Eastern cosmology you had you had the heavens of the heavens, the heavens, you know, see once first, second, third heavens, then you have under the sea, then you, you know, then you have earth. And what I'm saying is is that represents uh, that represents the entirety of the cosmos for what they believed the cosmos constituted, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm saying there's a there's a plain link, a correlation between uh, reality as um, they perceived it, and then and then there's a distinction between that and reality as it actually is. And I think we do the same, by the way. And I think this is where science is quite handy because we also use models to say, well, this is how we perceive reality, but then there's a sort of reality beyond that. There's a reality as it not, is. Yeah, not just models, but picture language and metaphors 
and then so oh, absolutely i mean yeah. all of our language is completely down with and, and endowed just, with just psychological to, terminology just to as well just just to reiterate what exactly to describe as chaos depictions of what i'm suggesting is that that is an illogical way of thinking about things to to hear mythicize objects and to observe that that actually does correlate with our universe. Yeah, but, but hang, oh, wait, wait, did you say? Okay, okay that's good. Let's, de I love that. Say, Let's debate that. Wait, just quickly. Did you just say illogical or logical? Did, um, did, did you well, okay. say that? Uh, uh, I did, I didn't speak, excuse me, wait. Um, it is illogical to believe that if somebody presents something that can be logically displayed onto the entire universe, it's illogical to assume that they knew more than they have said, and which is what you have to do with any Old Testament verse. Any, would, any, yeah, any yeah. scientific idea that the Bible suggests, you have to say, okay, well, they probably mythicized it, but that's assuming that they knew so much more that uh, they could. Uh, okay, I would, I would, I would, yeah, well, me, second, I would. One, one second, Wayne. Um, Revelation 12 is will fit it into this category quite nicely. So, you have a mythical story, pre-John, pre-Jesus, about a woman being chased in the wilderness by a dragon. Mm -hmm. That then becomes applied to Mary, then the Herod story, Israel as well being chased from Pharaoh. Like You have all these themes from the Old Testament and then more recent with Jesus and Mary and so on in the New Testament. And not just that, but you also have the astrological depiction of Virgo next to Hydra uh, being chased, and um, and that and that uh, uh, the Scorpio in Libra. So Libra was part of the uh, the claws of Scorpio, and so Scorpio is another depiction of the dragon just behind uh, Virgo, about to devour the child that Virgo is going to provide. So no, notice you have Virgo, the Virgin. She's about to produce a child, and so on. Revelation then says that the moon is at her feet and then she's clothed with the sun. And if John says, I see this in the sky, we guess what? We can actually go in astronomy software and actually depict that alignment exactly and pinpoint a particular date. So here's the point. Here you have all these mythical elements. John utilizes those mythical elements because that's the audience that the audience that that he's writing to which would be the seven churches and not just that but any greco-roman person reading this and or hellenized jew that's the only way they can understand it they won't be able to understand things like the ecliptic and that is, you know that is you know modern, modern astronomical terms well that's that's phenomenon that's phenomenological or whatever that's uh, yeah they it is it so and it's you so what does that mean that means nothing so it's that, no it means a lot <laughs> What I agree with that. We all agree that that's good marketing uh, to you. Things that everybody second, already it means a lot because we have, what I'm saying is that means a lot because you're stepping into their shoes, seeing how they observe the world. Yeah, yes, marketing. they utilize mythical elements, but that does not mean that the actual historical event did not take place because uh, it that, did. exactly. No, no. Uh, this, this is the, this is a good example. Um, it would be the the you just use like the phenomenological in, in language, this case, the right? Birthday of Jesus. So the sun, I'm, so I'm the sun, the, the, the Jesus, sun rising and the the sun rising and the sun setting. So we 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 can say we, we can say I don't know uh, Xerxes at um, 354 BCE, whatever, right? Observed that the the sunrise and sunset, and then the next day he observed that the sunrise and the sunset. So, because obviously, if you take phenomenological language literally, um, obviously it's not true. However, that's what he perceived, and what was that reality representing? Well, it represented something behind that. Well, in fact, what we found out a couple of thousand years later, of, of course, was um, that uh, the model of heliocentrism. So, of, of course, there are there are multiple uh, examples or something. It appears to be perceived in one way to someone in the ancient and actually corresponds to a modern idea or a modern concept, a modern notion. So in other words, just because they said the sunrise, sunset, um, that wouldn't negate uh, the fact that at the same time that that, that was just another um, earth, uh, sorry, yeah, earth rotating around 
um, the sun. It would, well, just, obviously, just, there's just, still going to be a correspondence. Just here. quickly oh, on that, Mark. Just quickly on that with the heliocentric perspective. Believe it or not, early Christians like Alexander, um, uh, Clement of Alexandria, um, would use the menorah uh, as, in the, as a depiction of heliocentrism. So what he said was the middle candle was the sun, whereas the because they only knew of seven planets, so the other six rotate around the, the sun. And predominantly actually um, held a heliocentric perspective, but he didn't have the mathematics or calculus to defend the model. So they, they just stuck with a geocentric model. Hey, so Robert, again, therefore, again, therefore, therefore no, they stopped no. saying, Robert, therefore they stopped using language like sunrise, sunset, right? Because they knew the literal truth. Right. Yeah, but not what I'm saying is no. What I'm, like you get what I'm saying. I'm saying yeah, that's yeah, an yeah, ironic yeah. statement. They didn't stop use employing that language. I've re I've read both Clement and Ptolemy. Right. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. So Phenomenal the point is, have mythical things like the menorah showcasing heliocentrism. So you were uh, so also um, so Rob. From what I understand, the Greeks knew that the sun was the center of the solar system. Yeah. So it's so it's not a it's uh so to your point i would agree with you um that science it wasn't just you know modern times that we figured this out it was back in uh bc times BC, bce times yeah i would say i would say close to about three four hundred bc but before then there were there was a flat earth type cosmology during the babylonian mm -hmm. exile exilic period yeah hey guys i gotta run um uh Awesome. Had a great I wish I could say because it's you guys are actually really fun to talk to. Um uh, thanks, just, thanks, lot, Zach. thanks for hanging in there. Yeah, good talking yeah, to you, yeah. Zach. Cheers for that, man. Yeah. Let's do this all the time, guys. I'm like so ready to do this. Um uh, the, the last last super last thing that I was thinking, uh, I, I completely agree with what you guys are getting at. Uh where you, you are pointing out that if any myth happened about a real thing it doesn't mean that that real thing didn't exist and i completely agree with that couldn't couldn't disagree with it um and that's and so, I, I think i think that we should open up the next time a gospel and epistle talk like let's let's get ready for it let's try to present a case and do all that kind of whatnot because and Zach, let, let me say this as well uh yeah. i'm not a christian because of spiritual experiences. I, in fact, as a Christian, I didn't have the experiences Kevin had. I, I All I can say is the, the, the rare experiences I have had, I can't deny that it is from God's leading, but otherwise mm -hmm. it's just been dry. So why, why do I continue to be a Christian? It's because of the data, because it, it's, the same, it's the same thing as if I go into the lab and, and conduct experiments with respect to GPS systems and, and then utilize relativity, Einstein's relativity, initially, when I learned about relativity, you get that euphoria of, oh my goodness, the math is beautiful and look at, look at how it works. But now it becomes second nature to me and it doesn't phase me anymore. However, yeah, that doesn't mean that I just, I just go and reject here is a, the theory is still it's a, so I just wanted to say that before yeah. We, yeah I got most of what you said I got most of what you said but my uh, speakers are doing that really dumb thing and now okay. but one one last thing if where where can I find this video Did, or is this this was a live thing is it gonna pop up somebody somewhere yeah it's on my it's on my sentinel apologetics youtube okay so it's okay because i'm probably gonna want to watch it later uh, i got yeah, your sure. hang i got your message with the link uh rob is that the one you you sent out uh no let me give you the the youtube link in the side chat here hey zach okay. why, why do you want to watch it later is it because you want to see your own incredible good looks and charm or <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> no no i mean because i remember like a few uh handful of times where all of us mentioned uh, sources, you know. So, uh, Chata, if you can you see, know, it. I, I'm uh, trusting all you guys' ideas on sources. So, you know, we we all need to get to the bottom of it, and and uh, we should reconvene for some, you know, gospel epist uh, epistles talk. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah.
right? Uh, it was super nice talking to you guys. I'll, and I'll I'm going to go out. too, guys. So thank you, Zach. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Wayne. Take care. Yeah. Oh, okay. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. All right, General Hunt, do you, want to, do you want to wrap it up and then we can move to Discord or what? Hello? Habibi, Mark, I want you to troll everyone and convert everyone to be Muslims. Go ahead. Inshallah. <laughs> in, inshallah, we all be Muslims. Come on. We all know the evidence is in the Quran, fellow brethren. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, Rob, you went and became an uh, Like I ran track and went to like all my schools. I was like the student section leader for my high school's uh, sports teams and stuff, so... That's basically what I spent all my time. Anyway, yeah, Rob, do you want to wrap, wrap up the live? Yeah, I'm going okay, to wrap yeah. it up. Any, yeah. any last words? So, Wayne, give a one-minute review. Richard, Carrier, you do it. Matt, <laughs> if you can. Mark, give your um, your Shahada. And Josh, and <laughs> your thoughts as well. Go ahead. Can, can you guys hear me? <laughs> Hello? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. All right, nobody, nobody said anything. I thought I was invisible for a minute. I thought I was God. <clears throat> but <laughs> on, a, on a serious note, I was I was I was thinking about this earlier, and you guys just rip my argument to shreds if you don't think it's a good uh, argument. But I I guess everybody in here agrees with the whole evolutionary story, uh, story about how humans came to be human, right? Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody, just... This is, okay. this is closing. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm I'm just I'm just saying. So uh, yeah. So it, it, it's just funny to me how uh, as soon as we see humans, number one, uh, we start to eat meat and our brains start to grow. And as soon as our brains start to grow, we get religious. Uh, Neanderthals start to bury their dead and they start to leave flowers, right? And it shows that you know they believed in some type of deity. As soon as humans start to get intelligent, <laughs> they 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 start to have this sense that uh that there's. Uh, some divine presence there's a god and as we get more and more and more intelligent now we have something like philosophy and like you guys know in the ancient Near east people didn't people didn't really challenge the existence of god it was like a second nature thing and then philosophy comes and we need to start bringing arguments and proof for a god for a deity and now we get to 2018 today where people still believe in god and so basically what i'm saying is number one the I think the belief in God shows some some form of intelligence. Uh, other like lower evolved animals, they don't believe in God because they can't. They can't. They can't comprehend something like God. I mean, if I went and I bought my cat up to me, my cat wouldn't understand. Uh, <laughs> secondly, <laughs> then and and secondly, uh, along with that, uh, if the idea of God was such a bad idea or such a bad hypothesis, we would have been forgotten about this whole thing back when. Uh, number one, humans evolved even more. We started making stuff like instruments and stuff all the way to philosophy. If if this whole religion thing was such a bad hypothesis as so many people claim, philosophy is like algebra. Philosophy is a way to check your work. Uh, as a matter of fact, philosophy gives better math. Uh, but I will argue that uh, we got so smart to the point where we could disprove this notion of God philosophically, but we didn't because it works. And so that's my whole argument. All right. Okay, Richard Carrier has just had a, a brilliant facelift, and so he, next <laughs> he looks like far younger and <laughs> He looks ten times more handsome now. Oh no, not, not actually Googleplex. Googleplex times more handsome. I've been looking forward to building a new America together. And ours looks together. Yeah. So go ahead, Rich. Oh, you're close. Um, that was interesting. Uh. I wanted to ask uh, Zach what he thought of the Book of Acts and and whether it was historical, uh, because um, I would say like Luke gets so many tiny things right uh, about uh, the places he's traveling to. It's very hard, like. I saw Richard Carrier said um, his argument against the Book of Acts was he said he, he must have used source material for all the stuff he got right 
But then for like the census and uh, Jesus' trial, he's totally making stuff up. And that was his argument against it. Um, I don't know. I guess that, like if the book of Acts is even reasonably historical, it talks about James, the brother of Jesus. So that debunks. So, so there you go. Richard, Richard Carey has just affirmed the history of Acts. <laughs> <So. laughs> um, Matt, I don't know if you can say anything, um, but I, I guess I can go straight to Mark because because Matt's like. Well, who, who else is still here? We've got Josh Hunter. Uh... So I, I'm going by what I see here from right to left. So we've just oh, got okay. Wayne, Richard Carrier, now Mark. All right, here we go. La ilahi. Il <laughs> um, um, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Okay, okay. Oh, there it is. There do, it is. Do a Zach, do a Zach like and Mike impression, Mark. Like say in in chapter thirty three, verse twenty two. We read. Uh, that, that reminds me of Paul Letterality. He used to do that, yeah, and then he'd even do the 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 fake applause. Like, Surah, Surah Abu Bakr, this fifty-nine. Okay, I got, I, I got one. I got. Surah Al Nisa, Ayat thirty-nine. Wait, wait, wait! This is Mark's closing. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, here's my closing. Here's my closing. Stand up, fight for yourselves. Never die. Never give up. Jesus loves you. God loves you. Jesus historically existed. There is no dispute among that among real historians. There's a few quackpox out there, but Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of God, and you guys better repent. You better freaking repent, man. <laughs> Amen. That basically should right. have been the entire live stream. Josh, your turn. Right. Uh, I just want to say, as I was listening to all that, um, which was quite interesting on both ends, both discussions was great. Um, Got a little bit fuzzy um, when everyone was speaking over each other on rare occasions. But I honestly really do think and believe that research, doing your research and keeping up to the data will, uh, will really grow your intellectual, I think, understanding of even engaging in this type of thought and engaging in these type of discussions because I, I'm not I'm not I'm not hounding on Zach. I don't know his life. I don't know who he is from a bar of soap. But um I, I felt that there was a lack of on his end of research that he's done um compared to the material and the data you guys will bring in. And yeah, I just, I just really think that um, I think encouraging Zach, even now, just to, you know, wherever you're at in your life, um, I believe uh, Jesus works in, in everyone's heart, and just to keep doing thorough research and yeah, God bless you all, type of thing. Hunter, your turn. Um, so for my closing statement is refuse to quit and do not die doing it when it comes to your research into your everyday lives and trying to better yourselves. And also stop wasting time would be a good one. And just lollygagging around, like take your day, take your time and actually move forward into trying to do something um, to not only better your life, but to better the world as it is. Also, Jesus is Lord, and He is the Messiah, and everybody should believe in Him because He, like Matt said, or I'm sorry, <clears throat> like Mark said, um, He is Lord, and people need to understand He does exist historically, and anybody who disagrees can fight me, and that'll be my closing statement. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> my beautiful fiance Erin your thoughts if you can hey yeah I was uh, actually working out 
the last like hour <laughs> and listening. So I just got done. But um, I came in on when you guys, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Because I'm in the truck and it's, I don't know how the reception is, but um, I came on in when you guys were talking about who God is and then faith. I wanted to chime in a little bit about faith because you said faith shouldn't be like part of anybody's belief or idea on things, but there's plenty of things that, you know, atheists, everybody believes, but they can't see. So like gravity, other minds, you know, exist other than my own, um, you know, physical properties that we can't see. I mean, I can't see bacteria, but there's evidence to prove, you know, that I do, I, I know that exists. So much like, in that way, it's not much different in my belief in God because it's a cumulative case. And so I think um, we could have touched on that maybe, or I wanted to chime in about that. Um, so everybody has faith, whether they accept that you know or not. Um, and then, yeah, I thought the discussion was good. Um, I wish Zach would have given his points for things because I feel like I didn't really get anything. It was just assertions. Um, so it'd be interesting. I'm sure he has the points. It just, I know off the top of a person's head, it can be hard to just articulate everything that you've read. Or So yeah, it was a good discussion from when I came in. You guys did good. It was wholesome. I just want to reiterate Song of Songs, chapter four, verse one, that you look absolutely beautiful, my darling. Uh, <laughs> all right. Wait, read her the rest in the Ella voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't have well, a microphone well. for that anymore. <laughs> well, all I can say oh, is, well. Oh, man, man, but she would have loved that, that man. That was, I would have become was... aroused. That was so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> what, what other voice? <laughs> Just, just to illustrate, I had a, I had a different microphone like three years ago, and I, there was a function where you could be like a god, and so <laughs> we walked into a Muslim room one day, and I got on the mic, started you know talking like Allah and reading from the Quran, and then I started reading from the Song of Songs, <laughs> all this sexual lingo, as oh. Allah. Yeah, that was funny. Okay, um, Christian man, go ahead. I'm just going to quote Acts 17. Um, for him we live and move and have our being, as certain even your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Fatwa. But, Amen. Uh, men. But I just want to say that the conversation and the atheists that were brought in the room were great. I have to applaud them for not being, unlike other atheists, being very arrogant. So I applaud them on their at least humility, I guess you could say. Yeah, I would second that. They were very nice. <laughs> I mean, they would be nicer compared to me if I was. Yeah. Yeah. There's just there's just some atheists who you can tell that they, I think, in their hearts, they are they are out to pursue the truth, you know. And I think these guys are yeah. definitely among them, and that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, they are ex-Christian after all, and it's. Uh, uh, it's yeah, so that's yeah. the reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, folks, thanks a lot. Thanks again to you guys coming in. It was the last moment notice, and uh, they wanted to have a discussion. I thought, you know what, instead of just having Hunter and myself in there, I'll just put the link out everywhere, and, and if you guys wanted to join, and so, so I really appreciate it. And I hope that all this is for God's glory at the end of the day. So I'm going to end the broadcast now.